Okay, it let me unmute myself. Are we ready? I'm ready whenever you guys are. Thank you so much. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council meet, regular meeting of July the 12th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are, appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting progress. Process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org virtual forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or, or to sign up to speak on sep particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call vote? Council member call. Fair? Here. Council member Pearson? Here. Council member Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. Motion carries. Or, I'm sorry, you have a quorum. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance okay. to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, 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 under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. For all. McClary has a special guest that I would like to take out of order due to the guest's other commitments. So I'd like to, on the agenda, move to right after the posting, uh, an inter introduction of Steve's guest. Okay. So may I have an approval of the agenda with that change? I so move. I'll second it. Will you take a... A roll call vote, please. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion. Okay. Thank you. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on July 2nd, 2021. Well, Mayor, just, Mayor, if I may, I just want to point out that you are slowly sliding away from view. It's like you're in quicksand. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was so intent on following the script, I neglected to notice what was going on with the camera. Uh, Steve McClary, is your guest in the room? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I believe Assistant Chief Drew Smith is here. Uh, and he's going to give the council and the community a brief update on the uh, Tuna Canyon fire that we experienced last week and they're still mopping up on uh, and maybe some other updates as well. So if I could turn that over to Chief Smith. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody. And yes, I'd like to give you an update on the, the tuna fire and um, the, some of the challenges we had, but also a lot of the success that we had. So early morning, July 9th, uh, we had a fire reported, a wildland fire reported up Tuna Canyon. And it was a very uh, remote area. It was very challenging for firefighters due to the terrain, also it being dark. It was inaccessible, very remote, and it's very tough to navigate. 
So uh, your good firefighters uh, got very creative and laid uh, a quarter mile of hose to the point of origin up a very uh, wet uh, drainage uh, in Tuna Canyon that had a lot of obstacles in it, got to the heel of the fire and laid over a mile of fire hose up and around the fire. That was also coordinated, that was at night, it was also coordinated with our hand crews and our aircraft. We used three aircraft on the fire, one of those being the new uh, CH, um, the large helitankers, which carries 3,000 gallons that we've uh, communicated from the past several months. We used 69 Bravo as our spot, and to extinguish that fire from start to finish, the first night we did 80,000 gallons and to the end of the incident, we completed 133,000 gallons of water that came out of 69 Bravo. Um, our tactics on that were to uh, use the aircraft in conjunction with the hand crews to cut fire line around that fire and also with a progressive hose lay with 100% mop up. We went into Saturday morning that we staffed it very robustly for them to continue that mop up endeavor. It was very challenging to the rocks and steep terrain. So just some perspective, a 45 degree angle is 100% slope. And we had areas that had measured over 130% slope in some areas it was so steep. Your firefighters were literally using the hose lines and climbing on their hands and knees, if you will, to get to some different areas. It's very fortunate we did not injure anybody on that, but we went, I uh, gave them my leader's intent, which was you need to go slow to go fast. And so on that type of train, it's very challenging. Uh, we were coordinated with uh, Lost Hill Sheriff Station, also uh, California Highway Patrol. We uh, launched no evacuations. We did not see an immediate threat. We shut down Tuna Canyon from Saddle Peak to Pacific Coast Highway to leave us access. In that area where the fire was, there's no water sources. So we had to have a very strategic water shuttling operation with our fire engines and water tenders. Um, and as you know, with that road system, there's not a lot of places to turn around a, uh, uh, a fire apparatus um, that weighs 40,000 pounds and a water tender that weighs 50 to 55,000 pounds. Very challenging with that. Your Malibu public safety officer, Chris was on scene with us, giving us updates. Megan Courier was on scene as well. And on the, it was within the state responsibility area. So outside the city of Malibu yet, uh, we know that preliminary findings point to persons experiencing homelessness um, is most likely the cause of this. We do not have any people detained, uh, but yet we do know through investigations preliminary that is um, looking to where it could be the homeless that are within that area. I hiked it the other morning, which was Saturday morning up the drainage and there's, uh, from where we started our hose lay at the road up to the point of origin, uh, there was eight encampments that were heavily populated in there and uh, flourishing, if you will. Uh, the um, actions of your firefighters uh, were very courageous based upon uh, how challenging that fire is. So just remember something with wildland fires or any type of emergency, the size of it doesn't necessarily mean how complex it is. This was a fire that was only 3.8 acres, but had some significant challenges uh, and complexity based upon the terrain and the remote access. And with that, I will leave it to any questions uh, that you may have uh, for me. I just wanna take a second to express our thanks. And I see Bruce has his hand raised. Bruce? Right, same here. I, I don't have a question. That was a thorough, very thorough explanation and, and we've gotten information up till now as well. So I just wanted also to express our appreciation. You noted that size does not equal complexity. Of course, 
this could have become much any any fire can become a major fire if you guys don't get there promptly and, and stamp it out and our hats are off to you for doing that because who knows what this could have been so thank you and you're welcome sir thank you don't see any other hands raised uh steve has the same so steve does okay steve yes i would just like to echo the thanks you heard from the other people these firefighters are amazing. Uh, the stuff you do and how you do it, I don't know how, how, you, how you get it all done, but you do an excellent job, and thank you very, very much. We really owe you a lot for this one. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for the support, and we're glad to uh, accommodate and give you the best service we can, that's for sure. We appreciate you, Drew, and we know you have another appointment, and we're really glad you could come. It's the kind of news we love to hear. Great. Thank you for the support. And once again, anything that you need uh, from our office, please reach out to uh, Megan or myself. We'd be glad to, glad to take care of you, whatever those needs are, big or small. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to return to our previously scheduled meeting and we have now we're at item 2a communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda but for which the city council has subject matter agenda do we have any public speakers we have one public speaker for this item lynn norton lynn are you in the room i can't believe i'm the only person <laughs> when does that happen? Right now, you're in luck. So I have two things. One is, um, do we have an enforceable ban on poisons now, or is that still in the works? And if so, I'm wondering how the enforcement works. Like if someone sees their neighbor, you know, setting out bait traps or hiring somebody that does that, is, is, a, is a photograph of somebody doing that, is that, is that sufficient evidence or how do you know if someone's doing it and what is the repercussion for doing it and can we even stop these companies that come in here is there any is there any way that you know the city can um you know has any enforcement over them and then my other question is just that i called the planning department the other day and spoke with somebody and i asked them that if i wanted to add 50 feet to the back of my house how long would it take to get permits and she told me it would be six to nine months just to get through the planning department, um, not counting building a safety or anything like that. So six months was the optimistic number for putting 50 square feet on the back of the house. And I was just curious if that's normal <laughs> and if that's how it really works. Those are my two questions. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment here and let you know that when I remodeled the house that my wife and I owned on Carbon Mesa Road, I actually reduced the square footage of the building by 10 square feet, and it took me about six months to get the permit. I did add a big porch, but that's, uh, you know, there were structural changes to uh, support the porch and the roof for the porch. And and yes, at the time I thought it was excessive, and but that is the process that we were in. And it, it would be lovely if it could be quicker, and that's enough editorializing from me. Uh, so, since I'm not supposed to be speaking at this point, uh, do we have any commission or committee updates? You do not have any commissioners signed up tonight. Do we have a city manager update, Steve, other than the excellent one you just gave us? Uh, yes, I do have a fairly brief report for you, Mr. Mayor and Council tonight. Um, first off, as we continue to somewhat move to some transition of normalcy, happy to report that uh, uh, the senior center today uh, reopened uh, for general drop in use. Uh, they were going to be following the LA County Department of Public Health COVID-19 safety protocols. Uh, they're going to be open weekdays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and there is access to the general use areas of the center. Uh, including the computer lab and library. Uh, staff is also going to be available to seniors uh, with uh, dollar ready questions and program registration uh, during the operating hours. 
Uh, right now for the senior center, they're looking at resuming the indoor programs uh, September 1st, uh, assuming that COVID-19 restrictions uh, do ease over the coming months. So again, that's a target date uh, that could change as we move closer to September 1st. Uh, in the meantime, our community services department is continuing to coordinate their outdoor programming and hikes for seniors at Malibu Bluffs Park and Charmley Wilderness Park. A uh, couple of announcements that I just wanted to give regarding uh, COVID and the pandemic. Um, as not too surprising, although somewhat disappointing, uh, the rates of transmission uh, are up in LA County. Uh, this seems to be uh, a, a pattern that repeats itself throughout the pandemic. Uh, as restrictions are loosened, uh, we see to see we we tend to see some response in terms of rising cases and rising number of hospitalizations. Uh, unfortunately, that's been the case here in the past few weeks. Uh, while the COVID key metrics remain relatively low, uh, LA County Health is re reporting that they're starting to see a spike in community transmission uh, since July 1st. The seven day average of cases has increased 147%. The daily test positivity rate increased 133% and hospitalizations are up 34%. Uh, they believe this is due to increased intermingling and summer social activities and circulation of more variants of concern like the highly transmissible Delta variant. Um, public health continues to caution that there's an increased risk of COVID infection for people who are not yet fully vaccinated. Uh, in addition, the county is recommending that all persons, regardless of vaccination status, uh, continue to wear masks indoors uh, to ensure a prevention of a resurgence. And that is all that I have. Actually, I would like to uh, briefly ask if uh, our public works director, Rob DeBoe, could give a report on the Legacy Park water situation. There you are. Thank you, Rob. Great. Thanks. Uh, um, just a brief update. Um, I, I am in communication with La Paz. Um, they are looking into um, doing some modifications on their end to actually, for us to actually take in um, water from La Paz and, and help uh, bring that over to Legacy Park. Um, they're supposed to be getting to me later on this week and I'll hopefully put together some protocols and some um, ways to get that water over there. Uh, we're also looking into actually um, making a connection with our recycled water from our wastewater treatment facility. We, we are proceeding forward on kind of doing that and connecting that recycled water to our existing irrigation system and moving forward with that. Um, Hopefully we'll get everything wrapped up or, or get some movement on this week. Um, and, and I hope to have another report soon. Thank you, Rob. Okay. I think that takes us to city council subcommittee reports, mayor and council member meeting re attendance reports and inquiries. Who would like to present their council member report? I see Mikey's hand, then I see Karen's hand. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll make it pretty quick here. Um, looking here, I'm just looking at, at what it actually says. I'm supposed to do attendance reports and inquiries. Yeah, I don't know if I have an inquiry. I'll see if I can come up with one. Um, spoke at the Cultural Commission meeting um, with 11 other people on the modifications they wanted to make to their camping in Esha. Um, Ordinance, so that's how I'm putting it anyhow. That was the part that was interest, interesting to me. Um, I think we all know that our words did not seem to carry a whole lot of weight, to be honest. On Saturday, myself and some Arson Watch members, including the mayor, did some radio training on how to use the sheriff's radios. It's not the same as a walkie-talkie. It's a little more complicated. I'll just leave it at that. You better like acronyms. Um, went on two arson watch patrols over the 4th of July. Uh, traffic was really pretty slight overall compared to normal. Um, but uh, on the way back to Malibu West on the 4th, 
Uh, me and several Arson Watch members and BOPs played whack-a-mole with a whole number of people along Broad Beach putting off fireworks and uh, saw a really big show down by, looked like it was on Zuma at, um, down by, where was that down by? Down toward the high school. So didn't last long. We, we finally got everyone to calm down and luckily there's no fires. Um, I attended a nationwide webinar on homelessness and affordable housing as part of a series. I think there was 300 cities on it and maybe close to a thousand people. I attended a um, microgrid incentive program um, webinar that's part of a series as well. It's a little hard to see how the city may or may not fit into that, but uh, it's, it's actually a long series. I think it's put on by SCE and uh, it's, it's a lot of hours to be honest. Um, attended a Clean Power Alliance board meeting. Um, always very interesting on uh, renewable power and clean power. Attended a uh, community brigade meeting. That's what the fire follower program is now being called, community brigades. That's moving along. Hope to, as I keep saying, have more news soon. We'll see what soon is. Um, attended training online on crisis management, particularly on everything to do with uh, ICSs, uh, incident command systems, and EOCs, emergency operations centers. And it was a two hour training. Actually, one of the people reading was Brent Woodworth and several other people. And uh, it's a certification program. It was quite interesting and a heck of a lot of information. And I too am a little concerned about the uptick in COVID cases. Just as a reminder, everyone, it seems definitely to be picking on people that aren't vaccinated, go figure. So please, please urge caution. I'm urging caution to me. And to Lynn, um, the poison ban, I, I, I don't wanna get my details wrong, but it has to go back to coastal to be for one more, to be certified or whatever the right word is that I'm not gonna get right. Um, so it's not live yet. And what we do when we see traps out is a great question. Um, I, I, I think the city should put out information on that. And I actually don't know the answer other than get a hold of me and I'll find out and call it in, if, you know, whatever it takes. So thanks for bringing that up, Lynn. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Karen, I believe you're next. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would also, along with everybody else, like to thank Drew Smith and uh, Megan Courier, Chris Frost, and everybody that jumped into action with that Tuna Canyon fire. Uh, we all know how bad that terrain is and, and how many fires we've had there. Uh, just in recent memory, uh, they're probably all from homeless encampments. There's not much else up there. Um, I. I'm curious, I don't know if anybody knows and we don't have to find out tonight, but I'm wondering if this is also on the Brightman property as some of the previous fires have been. Yes, okay, I know he has a lot of land up there. I wonder if we can do anything to secure that, address that. Um, we seem to be just uh, replaying this with way too much frequency. Um, so that's something I think we ought to uh, be looking into. Um, and thank God for 69 Bravo. I will say that. Um, I too uh, attended the Coastal Commission meeting, uh, which was on the 7th. And there were several of us who spoke. Uh, I would like to thank um, Barry Haldeman, uh, put a lot into uh, notifying everybody. Uh, I have to say, I don't think it was uh, coincidental that we received very short notice. That's really too bad, uh, but that's the way it happened. Uh, there were several of us who spoke, um, Council Member Pearson, myself, uh, Adrian Fernandez from our planning department, Jeremy Wolf from Senator Stern's office, Wade Major, uh, Douglas Carstens, who represented the Ramirez Canyon homeowners and their action, uh, Mayor Grisanti, 
I'm probably forgetting somebody, uh, but there were quite a few of us that spoke and asked for, I think, extremely reasonable provisions to be kept in. Uh, and what was taken out of the language was the assurance of a once a day, even once a day, patrol by either a ranger or a staff member of this uh, camping item in the uh, H1 and H2 ESHA areas in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, the allowance of camping during red flag warning days and the reduction of the setback uh, from ESHA from, fit, from 100 feet to 50. I would like to use this as a call to action to anyone and everyone. This has got to go back to the county. I think those are entirely reasonable uh, provisions and I think they need to be put back in. So I welcome anybody to join me on that. Um, I do wanna say about 4th of July, I wanna thank uh, Lost Hill Sheriffs, the VOPs, uh, LA County Fire, our local lifeguards, Arson Watch, everybody who worked on making this weekend as safe as possible. And it, I think it went off as, as well as could be expected. And it was fun to have the parade back on Point Doom. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein and myself uh, and uh, Interim City Attorney John Cotty had a meeting on the 8th, uh, the ad hoc committee of the investigation into the allegations in the Wagner affidavit. We received an update from the two attorneys doing that investigation and the city issued a statement just pretty much stating that we received an update uh, and the investigation is ongoing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Steve, would you like to go next? You're muted still, there you go. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, 4th of July, I, I would also like to thank all the folks that worked on the 4th of July keeping this place safe. It was amazing. I was sitting on my deck late in the afternoon waiting for the line of cars to show up, uh, and they never showed. So I'm not sure exactly what caused that, but it, it was a pleasant weekend. I'd also like to thank the uh, fire department, and I know it, some people were disappointed, but they put a kibosh on the fireworks that night. Uh, and apparently they did that as a result of some problem they had when they looked at the uh, barge that was carrying the fireworks. That was the story that I got. Uh, and if, if that's what it was, I congratulate the, sheriff, the fire department for taking the effort to make sure if it isn't safe, they stab and do something and protect the community. So I thought that was good. Uh, Legacy Park, I was, you know, and, and I had a chance to talk to our, our city manager. Uh, I've got a lot of people looking for water in Legacy Park, so if we can get that, I think it'll, all the people walking around there with corn trying to, trying to find ducks to feed will be very happy once we get some ducks back in there. Uh, I had a lot of calls this week from people on compliance. On compliance dealing with both the dark sky ordinance and the dumpster ordinance. Matter of fact, I ran into the folks from Poison Tree Malibu who were out taking pictures uh, and there's a bunch of dumpsters that are just ignoring whatever rules we have. So the conversation I had with the city manager is, you know, look, if we're going to if we're going to pass these ordinances, we got to make sure we've got some enforcement. I mean, the residents have spent years working to get these things in, and and if we're not going to enforce them, it doesn't do us a whole bunch of good. So he's going to take a look at that, and I suggest if there's anything we can do to help, if you can let us know what the problem with you know getting some of this enforcement done. Uh, and getting these people to comply, I will certainly take an effort to try and, and, and fix some of that. I also spoke to a couple of our planning commissioners uh, regarding the, the, the planning commission meetings. Uh, and I had a chance to, to look at one of them a couple of weeks ago and they're, they're, they're getting a lot of, of these telecommunication towers incorporated into the meeting. And it's just sucking up an enormous amount of time. So a couple of the planning commissioners suggested maybe we should bring back the telecommunications commission, give it a very narrow focus, which says all you can do is, you know, look at these towers. You can't go off on any other path someplace. But if we can get them to maybe prejudge some of these towers before, be, before it comes to the planning commission, maybe we can make the planning commissioners a little more effective and make their uh, meetings get done in a, in a reasonable amount of time. 
and then to Lynn, uh, and it just, I'm going to try and bring back a telecommunications item or one of our next agenda. So if you got, I did not talk to all the planning commission. I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. So if you guys want to talk to your appointees and see if there's some, you, you know, consensus that that would help, uh, that may help us down the road. And then finally, Mikey, I think the, the enforcement program for poison, for the poison uh, free Malibu initiative, I thought what they were going to do is somebody was going to bring the enforcement program back to Zeracis. So we have a chance to take a look at it. And I think based upon that, we'll try and figure out what, what is the most effective way to put some enforcement rules uh, around that program. So that's what I got, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bruce, are you available? I am available and my technology seems to be working. So thanks for calling. Um, so I've been doing a number of things. One, I, I did watch the um, Coastal Commission meeting. I didn't speak because I thought there were enough voices and yet another one wasn't going to make any difference. And I'm sure it wouldn't have. Um, I have to say it, it's, it is interesting to see our city council members and state, city representatives on the public comment end of things, as opposed to sitting at the dais, um, you know, didn't seem to care what we said. Yep, that did seem to be the case. Short notice, it was. I, I hope that will sensitize us to better interacting with our own residents at these meetings. I get, I hear the same things from them all the time. I used to feel the same way before I was elected, and I, I try not to fall into that trap myself. I had proposed a number of potential reforms to make public input more meaningful, but they do seem to have been put at the bottom of a pile somewhere because they weren't even discussed at the um, city council special um, ad hoc policy committee meeting we had. So hopefully th someone will take a look at what I had proposed, what Steve and I had proposed, and think about that because it can avoid our residents feeling the way that our council members have felt at the um, Coastal Commission. I think it also demonstrates the, what, what happened there, a, greater, a need for greater diplomacy with the MRCA and the Coastal Commission. We need to stop treating them like their adversaries, even if they may be, uh, and find ways to reach common ground with them because um, fighting with them is not gonna get us anywhere. They have the power. Just like when people fight with us, at the end of the day, we're gonna do what we think is right. It's better to persuade us to do something different than to argue with us. Um, that's a perfect segue to the fact that um, a few weeks ago, I arranged a lunch with Joe Edmiston for the purpose of building rather than burning a bridge um, with him. And uh, we, had a very, we had a very cordial, very good conversation. Um, we discussed multiple items, including um, the issues that are plaguing a lot of our residents and didn't make any ground on them other than the fact that we had a good conversation and got to hear each other's views. But one thing that did come out of it was um, we just recently got a, um, and we discussed this at lunch, we got a, um, email from Joe um, telling us that he's got a lot of funding available and um, he would like to help Malibu become more fire resistant and um, better able to deal with fires when we're not able to resist them in the first instance. And um, the mayor and Steve McClary and I will be meeting with um, some representatives of the MRCA later this week to have a f further discussion of that. Obviously we won't do anything in without the, um, the full council's um, authorization, but we're having an exploratory conversation. Um, I, p p the residents may recall um, at the last meeting or the meeting before that, we took up the issue of whether city council would take a position on the Point Doom Community Service District's um, situation with LAFCO. LAFCO was recommending dissolution and is recommending dissolution. Um, at that time, we voted to take no position. That was our formal position. Um, three, three council members voted to take no position. Uh, Mikey vote, disagreed with that. I don't know where he was going to go if, if, if the disagreement had prevailed. And I abstained because I didn't know what the Point Doom Community Service District's position was. They now have taken a position. They've asked for a one-year extension. And I sent a letter to LAFCO or Dean LAFCO supporting the request for an extension. That their request made sense. Um, didn't seem like it would hurt anybody or cause, cost anything for anyone to let, give them the extra year. And it'll give them the opportunity to fish or cut a bait, so to speak. Uh, as Karen said, we met with the um, lawyers who are conducting the independent investigation. And there's been a press release that states very generally what's going on there. I've also been contacted by various residents who claim to have relevant information. 
And um, I'll be sharing that with the um, investigating lawyers when they interview me. They'll be interviewing all the members of city council. Um, enforcement, which Steve brought up. Um, I encourage, I, I've, I've spoken to a number of individuals who've approached me and complained about one thing or another. And I always tell them, you know, we'll report it to the city and see what happens, but copy me. So, you know, if, if people think that they're not getting results on their enforcement requests, copy us, copy me. I will follow up and see what's going on. Um, so it may be that there's not a problem, but if, if there is one, I'll, I'll be following up on your behalf with you. Um, homelessness continues, obviously, to be an issue. And, and again, I, I, I don't want to sound unsympathetic or unempathetic to those who are experiencing homelessness, but my first concern is the health, safety, and welfare of our residents, especially now that we have another fire. Um, and um, I'm hoping that the um, proposed ordinance to um, help regulate the homeless will come back. Um, I continue to do research. I continue to believe that it is viable. And um, I get a lot of calls and emails from residents talking about that. We also, as I think Karen was alluding to, need a, a, an ordinance with teeth to deal with vacant land that is privately owned because the city at this point can really only deal with public land. We're having a hard enough time dealing with public land, but we, we need something that gives us real enforcement ability to deal with the vacant land. Um, Paul and I have been working on um, ways to get CHP back into Malibu and there's a lot of lure about why they're not here, but it may not be accurate. And there may be a solution. Um, we're, we're looking at that. It's not going to be fixed overnight, but it's something that we are working on. And, um, you know, maybe a one to two year horizon. And I know that sounds like a long time, but in government, that's really not. Um, that may be solved. Um, let, Leslie, um, Steve McClary has been extremely helpful to me um, with information. Um, that I need to uh, better understand agenda items and various other matters that I'm considering proposing to council. Um, it's been a pleasure working with him. Um, and um, I did meet, I think we all met with the recruiter that we've hired that is going to help us find a permanent replacement. I'm sure Steve will throw his hat in the ring. Um, the recruiter, I understand, will be meeting with, me with senior members of the staff in the coming week. And hopefully we'll be, meet, we'll be meeting with residents or finding some other meaningful way to obtain resident input because the, we, all need, we all need to be in on this. Again, re, the residents' views are important. Um, you need to be heard. So um, I'm hoping we'll find a way to um, let you be heard. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I, I wanna thank everybody for their council member reports and especially for the people who uh, have done stuff so I get to talk, so I have to talk even less. Uh, I did appreciate the Point Doom Community Services groups who sponsored the uh, July 4th parade, and I was very pleased to, to ride in the parade, and it was a lot of fun. And if you've never been, be sure and go next year. You don't have to live on Point Doom, apparently. And it was just Crazy good fun to see all the little kids skateboarding and riding their bicycles next to the actual parade. So it was fun. I enjoyed it. And uh, Karen in encouraged me to do it. And thank you so much, Karen. Uh, uh, I spoke at the Coastal Commission hearing and I thought I did a really good job, but apparently not as good as I had hoped. And that was the Coastal hearing about camping and, and what can happen with the fires. I did the two, I did two nights of arson watch like Mikey. I, I had the pleasure of being the first person on site at a gentleman who had driven for no apparent reason into the arrestor bed at the bottom of Canaan. And it's, it's just amazing what happens out there when I'm usually home asleep. Uh, and I wanna thank all of the responders who showed up to help uh, the boat that uh, went aground in Paradise Cove when it pulled its anchor on the evening of the third. And uh, I'm glad it got cleaned up and I'm so sorry to hear that the boat had to be destroyed. And that's about it. And thank you very much. And that puts us at the consent calendar. So uh, we're looking at item 3A. Are there any 
items that anyone wants to pull. I'm looking for hands. I don't see any hands. Have any members of the public asked for an item to be pulled? No items have been pulled by the public. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll make we... a motion to approve the consent calendar. I will second. I have a first and second to approve the consent calendar. Will you take the roll, Kelsey? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us straight to item 4A. We're already halfway through our agenda packet. So, okay, item 4A is an appeal of Planning Commission Resolution number 21-15 at 33603 Pacific Coast Highway. Do we have a staff report? Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'll be presenting the report tonight. The, the applicant is also in the audience, as well as the project planner, DDA, uh, Morel, Morello, if there are any questions. Morello, sorry. If I may have the next slide, please. This is a vicinity map, an aerial photo, to demonstrate where the project is located. The project's located at the western end of the city, towards the western end. You can see all of the brown area of the aerial photo above the star. That's all ESHA area. Uh, so this property, while it is a large property, uh, does have a good portion of it that is uh, defined in our local coastal program as containing environmentally sensitive habitat area. If I may have the next slide, please. The project proposes the demolition of the existing home and a, the a development that's also associated with that home, such as the garage, patio, uh, concrete roadways, the swimming pool, the existing wastewater system would be abandoned and is proposed to be replaced. There would be the construction of a new residence uh, that is 9,300 square feet in size. It also includes a six car subterranean garage and basement area. There'll also be a swimming pond decks and other associated improvement, uh, new access ways, for example, and patios. If I may have the next slide, please. The project also included additional discretionary requests. And uh, just to make sure there is no confusion, originally there were two variances associated with this project. One for grading to exceed the 1,000 cubic yard limitation for non-exempt grading as well as a variance to exceed the allowable square footage of a total development square footage of a property. We've since found that there was no need for the variance uh, for the grading quantities. And the reason being, as I explained in the staff report, is that at the time of the planning commission meeting, the applicant had provided staff with all of the various planning approvals or con conceptual approvals. So while we had approved, uh, I wanna say roughly 900 cubic yards of grading previously, uh, there was additional information submitted, which was in the forms of the grading permits. So these are the permits that were issued by the building and safety division, inspected uh, um, when that grading took place. And there are subsequent grading reports as well. And in those permits, the number permitted was substantially lower, was uh, roughly 600 and some odd cubic yards. So if using the number of grading, the amount of grading that took place, plus the proposed grading, the number now was below 1,000 and it's for that reason that that one variance was removed. The other additional discretionary requests were the demolition permit for the removal of the existing on-site development as well as two site plan reviews, uh, one to allow for remedial grading and another site plan review to allow for height above, 28, uh, above 18 feet up to 28 feet. The remedial grading, as we mentioned in the staff report, there was a basis to approve that. However, uh, we could not find the project consistent with all of the requirements of the local coastal program because of its size. 
So that's why uh, staff did not recommend approval of that variance as well as the planning commission. And the second variant, our second uh, request, site plan review, excuse me, for height, there were no view impacts with this project uh, because of its location. There are no homes behind it. And there were no views that uh, came into play once the story poles were uh, installed. However, but for the similar reason with the remedial grading, uh, while there's not an issue with that, the issue being is the size of the home. Uh, because of the proposed square footage, we went beyond the allowable. And because of that, staff and the Planning Commission were not able to make all of the findings uh, that demonstrate this project is consistent with the local coastal program and our municipal code. And therefore, we had the uh, recommended. I have the next slide, please. Uh, this is just further overview of the proposed project. Um, as we mentioned, the issue here is that the, the biggie is that there's already 10,999 square feet of existing covered area. And in our zoning ordinance and in the local coastal program, total development square footage is anything with the solid roof on it. So while the home itself that's proposed is uh, below the allowable maximum, 9,300 square feet. When you add in the garage, the existing sheds, the existing horse barns, uh, while these structures may not be habitable, the fact is they have a solid roof. And because of that solid roof not being open to the sky, we have to look at this uh, all together. And so the code says that you're allowed an allotment of 11,172 square feet. And when you add in all of these structures, we end up with a square footage that's 16,413. And as I mentioned in the staff report and the, the associated report with this project, their staff was unable and as well as the planning commission to find some sort of hardship here, um, some denial of benefits granted to neighbors that uh, isn't being granted in this case. Uh, we were not able to find any uh, unfair treatment of the applicant. And that is why uh, staff uh, had the recommendation it did moving forward to the planning commission and the planning commission uh, adopted that re recommendation because they could not find any hardship or some denial of benefits to the applicant. If I may have the next slide, please. This is a site plan showing the proposed development. As you can see, it's located within the existing developed pad. Um, the single family residents would be located in roughly the same area as the previous residents. The swimming pond as proposed would be in a kind of a, a well area that's a, from existing grading as well as proposed grading. And the fire department turnaround is something new. This property was developed many years ago before cityhood and and of course, does it meet current requirements? And with this, it would. Next slide, please. This is a uh, blow up of the site plan so that it's visible, a little bit more visible and just focused on the one area. If I may have the next slide, please. These are pictures of the story poles. You could see the existing home in the foreground of the pictures. And as you can tell, uh, by looking at behind in the background, there are no other homes in the area. It, this home, home, because of the size of the property, it, there were no view impacts. Next slide, please. These are pictures of the property when viewed from Pacific Coast Highway. As you can see, the home is well set back. It doesn't block any predominant views of ridge lines or of the mountains. Next slide, please. Uh, so once again, this is just a bit further information about the variance that, uh, that was requested to exceed the maximum allowable square footage. And um, once again, we had to treat habitable or non-habitable structures. It, it doesn't make a difference. The code is very clear on anything with the solid roof. And that's why the Planning Commission uh, came to the determination that they did. Next slide, please. The applicants, uh, this is a summary of the appellant's reasons for the appeal. In this case, the appellant is also the applicant. Um, there 
no one spoke out against the project at the hearing. It uh, was just the applicant in the audience. And the grounds, as mentioned in the staff report, are that uh, you know if this property were to be subdivided, you could have more total zone square footage. However, that's not what was proposed. That would need additional analysis. And furthermore, there is ESHA on the property. We would not uh, be consistent with our coastal program if we were to subdivide a property in such a manner that created additional impacts to ESHA. The applicant also felt that there were incorrect and, uh, and unsubstantiated statements made by members of the Planning Commission uh, that created an environment that uh, tarnished the credibility and quality of the project and its compliance with the city's uh, local implementation plan from the local coastal program. And also that the Planning Commission denied approval of both site plan reviews uh, when they could be approved. And as I mentioned uh, with this, the, the main issue here is the size. If the size would have complied with the code, we could have made all of the findings in the affirmative. But the way that the findings are, and I mentioned this, uh, this is mentioned in the agenda report, the way the findings are written, we're required to find that a project is consistent with all requirements. Uh, and Given the size, that was one requirement it didn't comply with, and that was the basis for those determinations. Next slide, please. In summary, uh, staff recommends that the resolution be adopted and denying the appeal, uh, which would be consistent with the Planning Commission's determinations. I'm available for any questions, as well as, as I mentioned, our staff planner. And I also believe that the applicant, they have a presentation for you and they are also available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malika. Okay, is uh, council member disclosures would like to go first? You got none. Karen? I received an email from uh, Lauren Kaufman on the project. And I replied that I would uh, get back to her if I had any questions. I heard Bruce, I heard Steve say he had no, 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 dis no disclosures. disclosures. I, I received an invitation to visit the property. I did visit the property. Uh, they went over the plans with me, walked around the property. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's got great views. Uh, no question about what they were doing. And I didn't learn anything that wasn't in the agenda report. Anybody else? Mikey? I think I think Bruce has had his hand up for so I'm long. I'm sorry, Bruce. I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Actually, do, do we need to speak up if we have no disclosures, or is that just implicit by our silence? Uh, it's better if you if you say no disclosures. Okay. Or Great. that you didn't visit the property or whatever it is. I didn't visit the property. I didn't speak to the applicant or anyone else. And that is my policy. I won't be doing that for these hearings. Okay. Mikey? Uh, I visited the property and met with the homeowner and the architect. Um, as Paul the mayor said, it is a gorgeous piece of property. I realized while I was there, not that it really factors in, I believe I learned to ride horses on that property when I was a wee little lad. So it's definitely been a horse property for a long time. Um, I learned basically just got a 3D conceptual look at what the property looked like and was able to see if there was any sort of view issues or, or any sort of thing that stood out. Probably the thing that stood out most was something that surprised me that's not related. So it has its own natural spring on the property that actually has flowing water. I did not know there was, that was completely caught me off guard. Pretty amazing, pretty rare. So, um, and the horse barn was absolutely the most beautiful buildings I've ever seen, but uh, not something where humans live. So that's my disclosure. Thank you, Mikey. Okay. Uh, I believe this is the appropriate time for the appellant applicant team to present. Yes, we, we have, have 
we have Lauren Kaufman here, and then we don't have any public speakers, so we won't need to reserve time for rebuttal. She can use her full 15 minutes now if she'd like. Thank you. Lauren, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, if they would put up the presentation, slide one, please. Great, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, I hope you... I hope you had time to read through the uh, Planning Commission PowerPoint presentation, along with the other documents from planning, as it contains a lot of information about this property. Um, I'll be providing a summarized version of that presentation. Uh, slide two, please. The current project site has 15.4 buildable acres, as indicated by this slope analysis map. Slide three, please. It's the only parcel that I could locate of this size in Malibu with this quantity of build buildable square footage. And that's a comparison of all the properties through Malibu. Slide four, please. I would like to propose this evening a modified variance request as follows. A variance request for an exemption of the accessory non-dwelling buildings from the TDSF calculation for this property in lieu of requesting additional TDSF to accommodate the proposed new main house. The accessory buildings include the horse barn, 3,648 square feet, and the hay barn, 452 square feet, for a total of 4,100 square feet that would not be included in the TDSF. The remaining existing dwelling structures, the existing studio building, 1,146 square feet, the existing guest house, 1,807 square feet, and the proposed new main house, 9,360.5 square feet, would make up the property TDSF. The proposed total TDSF of the studio building, guest house, and proposed new main house is 12,313.5 square feet. We will reduce the existing total square footage by 1,141.5 square feet to fit into the allowable TDSF of 11,172 square feet. This would include possible modification of the guest house and reduction of the proposed new main house. The reasons for supporting this variance request are as follows. Number one, the current calculation for the TDSF does not allow fair development of properties with buildable acres above five acres. As outlined in my appeal letter, item one, the TDSF of 11,172 square feet for five buildable acres is equal to allowing development of 5% of the property. The TDSF of 11,172 square feet for 15.4 buildable acres is equal to allowing development of 1.7% of the property. That large discrepancy is not allowing equal developmental rights for the owner. Development of 5% of 15.4 acres is 33,541.2 square feet of development. To tell a property owner that he should subdivide his property to have equal development rights is not a solution. Number two, by agreeing to keep all dwelling buildings within the allowable TDSF, the applicant is supportive of the intention of limiting mansionization, the practice of building the largest possible size of home that the property setbacks would allow, which is the intention of the TDSF code. Slide five, please. This variance request of not requiring inclusion of non-dwelling structures in the TDSF allows the applicant to have accessory structures that support the historic use and the general plan visionary use of the property for open space uses such as horses and slide seven, which is, hello, Slide seven, please, the next one, and then skip that one, please. And agricultural uses. This represents the terraces on the upper part. Number four, this variance request would allow, oh, slide number eight, please. This variance request would allow the owner to maintain the property as one property instead of subdividing the property into two or three properties. 
which would easily accommodate the maximum TDS of 11,172 square feet for each property. This would be the most environmentally insensitive solution as potentially three structures of this size equaling a minimum of 33,516 square feet would use more water, more power, create more pollution from more vehicles and impact more habitats in the ESHA on each property. Thank you very much for considering this request and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Lauren. We don't have any public comments. Uh, we don't need rebuttal time. So we're into council discussion. Who would like to begin? I see Bruce's hand is in the air. Okay, so thank you for that presentation. I, I was prepared to go to bat for this project. I don't know whether I was gonna be able to get there. I had a lot of questions, but I was prepared to advocate for it because I thought it was beautiful. And I thought that the, the, the rationale for it not being able to proceed along the lines of what you just argued made a lot of sense to me. But now you've got a new appeal. Um, that procedurally prob is problematic to me. Are, are you abandoned, this is a question, are you abandoning the application that is before the council and now making a different application? You, you do not want us to consider the application that was put before us? You may answer, Lauren, if you unmute. I'm sorry, I was, uh, I was muted. Yeah. Um, no, we're not abandoning the proposal where we just presented it in a different way. No, no, here's my problem. You're asking now for a different variance that that we don't have any idea what the planning department's view on that is, what the planning commission's view on that is. This is a de novo hearing. That means we, we make a fresh decision on the record that was developed and on the application that was developed, but it doesn't mean this is a brand new hearing on a brand new application. I don't see how we can do that. Yeah, uh, I'm Mr. Kaufman. This is um, uh, uh, Klaus Heilig. I'm the owner of the property. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, the mayor, and the councilman that was at my property and looking at everything. No, I, I, I stay with it, what I said from the beginning. You know, I would like to have this property as one property. And I, I just fall in love with all this out there. And uh, initially, I didn't even plan to do uh, what I want to do just now. I just, uh, I, I fall in love with Malibu, and uh, I just want to keep this as a as a one residence and uh, the property itself is such a beautiful property. And I am, you know, part of some of uh, the environmental uh, associations, you know, I'm a member of a certain things. So I'm really aware of all the things and I want to keep it the way it is. And, you know, I do whatever is necessary to, to, to make this happen. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. So I guess I would like to ask other council members if we get clarity on are, are we as a group prepared to go forward if this is a different application, because like I said, I, I, I think there's a lot of arguments, they may not carry the day, that support this, this, this application, but the application that was just made by Ms. Kaufman is not the application, as I understand it, that was presented to us. And I don't, I don't think we can adjudicate that application. I, and I don't want to go back and talk about the other one if, if we've got this new one, and I don't want to address this new one if if others agree with me that this new one is dead on arrival because you can't look at a new application. Mikey first and then Karen to respond to you, Bruce. Thank you. I don't know that I raised my hand to respond to that. Um, it is a very valid point you make, Bruce. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, it does it does potentially somewhat change the issues. I agree without being able to study it. it you're right. I wouldn't know how to proceed because we haven't had any time to study that. So that, I guess, I guess that means I would agree with you. Karen? Um, yes, Bruce, I agree with your point uh, about uh, it doesn't look like what is before us now is what uh, we're being asked to consider uh, verbally. But my other issue with this is um, 
it sounds like we are being asked to redefine uh, planning terms. Uh, the horse barn, the hay barn, the studio building. I don't believe that's uh, that we have the ability to do that. So the, the total developable square footage uh, remains the same. So I, I don't know if the new proposal that we've been given verbally uh, would allow us to approve this project. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Bruce, you have the floor again if you want it. Well, I'm, I'm still not clear on what we're doing because it's like I said, if, if the application is the one that was just orally described and if at least three of us aren't prepared to rule on, so to speak, a brand new application, there's no point going forward. If the original application is still the one that we're considering and not this revised one, then we can proceed. But it, it sounds like the representative of the client anyway has proposed something different. And so it, I, I need the clarity on what we're doing here. If, if I may, it, it seems like that they're simply expressing some flexibility if we come up with an idea that would allow them to go forward. Uh, and I, I don't, uh, I don't believe in in the council designing a project for people. Uh, so I'm I'm not. Uh, I appreciate the flexibility, and uh, if there were something that could be done, I, I would be delighted to hear about it. And I I agree with Mikey. It's a beautiful property. I love what's going on with the gardens and all the rest of that. But our our big problem is that the um, we were not elected to be emperors. We don't get to make rules and, and accept make rules and, and legislate them before the uh, council and get everybody to vote on it. And then, you know, once that rule is passed, we don't get the opportunity to make rules ad hoc on an ad hoc basis while we're sitting here. And that's the problem I see with this as well. Mayor, if I, if I may jump in uh, briefly. Please do. I, I believe it, the issue here is, is square footage. And I, I feel that what the uh, appellant is giving you is perhaps a, a different argument or a different way to look at it. Um, because it's at the end of the day, what they need is a variance from the the LIP's total development square footage limitation. And so if I understand Ms. Kaufman correctly, what she's proposing is a system where we look at the variance and try to parse out the non-habitable structures um, and you have because, uh, sorry, I apologize for the stuttering. At the end of the day, because what she's trying to do is find a way that it, you know, demonstrates that the house and the habitable structure is below the 11172. And that would be the ability to grant the variance, I, I, I want to say in Ms. Kaufman's uh, perspective, is that that would be the way to grant it because overall the house is smaller than the allowable size and all the additional structures are that extra square footage, but, but we still would need to do as we're doing here, regardless of how you view habitable, non-habitable, uh, the code states that something with a solid roof, if it's not open to the sky, counts as square footage. And so um, if, I think it's more of just a different argument for the same thing. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope that makes sense. Richard, that's helpful to me because I, I didn't understand. Is the applicant still asking for exactly the same project but just making a different argument about why it ought to be granted? Or are they offering to make some kind of tweaks so that it's a different project than the one that was put before us on appeal? In the presentation, I'm, and I, would, I asked that we perhaps ask Ms. Kaufman this to be clear. Uh, so one, I heard the, the different requests of how we allocate the square footage, but there might have been a, a thousand square foot difference, which if that is true, uh, then 
I, the the council, if you would like, we could definitely remand that back to the planning commission uh, to see if you know the removal of a thousand square feet uh, changes the analysis or. Well, let's 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 not go to remand yet because that's actually an issue that we would need to that we'll need to discuss as a procedural matter as well. But is this a different project or are we just being given a different argument on the same exact project, Ms. Kaufman? Okay. Can you all hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, I, we can I, hear I you. A long time. It's the same project. It's the same project. Um, in fact, it actually would end up being a smaller project because we're trying to fit, as Richard explained, and I appreciate that, uh, all of the dwelling structures um, would fit under the 11,172 TDSFs. Wait, wait, um, it may, maybe I'm just using technical words imprecisely, but you said it's the same project and you say it's a smaller project. I don't see how those compute. Is this project that you are looking to build completely on spec, spec, spec the exact same thing that is in the, in the papers that were put to us, or are you making some changes that make it smaller? The only the only changes would be um, reducing the size of the house by a little bit, but it's the same house. Same everything is the same. So it's it's meant to to be almost a compromise to be more to try to get it more acceptable by the city council. It's the same project. I took it that way too. Just offering a compromise to try and find a path forward is how I took it. Um, I I think it's a. I left this the property really thinking about this project a lot because it's a very unique property. I've never heard in my all my years on planning or anything. Uh, uh, never seen a project like this come forward. Never had a request like this. It's brand new to me. I think if we look directly at the language of the code, we can't approve this the way the code is laid out in my understanding of it. And uh, I took quite a look at it after going to the property, but there's another side to this that maybe it doesn't factor in here, but, and the applicant said it, this is a very easy property to subdivide and suddenly you can have more square footage, which, I don't think it was the intent of the code, but that's the position the code left us in. And what this is to me also, this is a sneak preview of SB9, if and when that gets passed, then a property owner or a property like this will have by right the ability without us being able to stop it, just subdivide it. Um, and that's a pretty scary thought. So. We have an applicant that's offering to do something with uh, within constraint that's bigger than our code allows us to to uh, approve. But yet, there's a side to that where it is, in a sense, maybe following our vision statement more than the other options, which is a odd place to be in and one I've never been in before. So I uh, I just wanted to point that out, that there are a lot of ways to skin this cat. And um, with that, I'll let everyone else speak. Thank you very much, Mikey. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment, Bruce, and then I'll go back to you. Sure. Ms. Kaufman, did you consider the option of, of uh, cutting the existing uh, horse facilities and the guest house down there off on five acres and building the house back here, which would be on the other 20 plus acres? Well, the house and the guest house are less than 11,172 square feet. Um, mm -hmm. It's not our intention to, to subdivide, but that is probably how it would be subdivided. With the, 
And if you were to do that, what you want to put on the on the back piece could all be done, I believe, based on the numbers on my yellow pad here, which Correct. is probably wrong since I'm doing it as I'm sitting here. Okay. I see Bruce's hand. Bruce, thank right. you, Lauren. So, look, I, I, I was thrown for a loop with this change because I, I do see it as a change, but let's let's deal with the application that's made. Uh, a number of council members have said so far, and I, I think clearly that it's their belief, and maybe they're, they're absolutely right, that this can't be approved. It's, it, it doesn't comply with the code. I had thought, and I'd like guidance on this from John um, or, or Richard, perhaps, the request is for a variance. I mean, the variance is asked for because it can't be done without the variance. But is it the case that this can't be done if a variance can be granted? Because I, I thought that it could be done if a variance can be granted. Councilmember Silverstein, if you can make the findings for a variance, the project can be approved. Okay, so the code doesn't preclude it unless a variance can't be granted. That's correct. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. Because again, I'm sorry, I, Silverstein, I, the code prohibits it unless you can make the findings for a variance. I think we said that's, it. That's that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, so so when when others were saying it it can't be done, I guess they were perhaps shorthanding that for the variance can't be granted. I'm not sure that's the case. Let's talk about that because. You know, first of all, I should say, and, and this is consistent with what Mikey said and, and perhaps others, um, we approve multiple projects over objections of residents, including very cogent objections. Here, there's no objections, and we got a beautiful project. From what I can tell, you know, it, it's one that the owner will be will love to live there, and it will it, it, it's it, it's consistent with our vision, not necessarily with the technicalities of our code, but our vision. Um, especially since, as the applicant says, it ends up preserving a lot of land that otherwise, if it were subdivided, could be built on. Um, you know, some applications are black and white. Either you absolutely can't get there or you absolutely have to approve them and others, there's flexibility. So I want to see if there's flexibility here. Um, obviously, we can't approve something that, that can't lawfully be approved. One of the findings that, that the paperwork says we have to make to be able to grant the variance, I'm going to read it, is there are special circumstances where exceptional characteristics applicable to the subject property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, such that strict application of the zoning ordinance deprive such property of privileges enjoyed by other property in the vicinity or under the identical zoning classification. And the staff says that finding can't be made. Uh, there might be a real thin argument for why it could be made, but I, I, I tend to agree that we're not looking at a hardship issue here. But on the other hand, there's a benefit. If, if, the, if the property owner will agree to certain things, there's a benefit to Malibu if this project proceeds and we have a lot more open space. Must we find that there's a hardship, or can we also grant the variance if there's a benefit? That's that's a legal question I need answered. No, there has to be a hardship, Councilmember Silverstein. It can't can't simply be a benefit. There has to be something endemic to the property that 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 such that that property is deprived of ben of of things that other properties in the same zoning district are able to take advantage of. And okay, if you so can't make that finding, you have to deny, deny the variance. Okay, we, so we must find that there's a hardship or they're being deprived of a prop, of a privilege that someone else has. The only way I can see getting close to getting there is this point that Ms. Kaufman made about it being a unique piece of property. So, I mean, that, that takes it away from considering other properties. And it is a hardship to be able to not use all of the TDSF that you would have if you had a bunch of separate properties, but but you buy the property knowing that. That's I mean, yeah, I, I, I said during the campaign, I'm troubled by the fact that you can have a hundred acres and you're still stuck with the same size maximum as somebody with five acres. That doesn't make any sense to me as long as it's not a problem for view, bio, bio, biological, you know, and all that stuff in here we're being told is not a problem. Um, and yet we've got this technical issue 
I don't know. I, 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 I want to approve this. I, I, let me ask before we maybe the others will agree we can. I don't know. Would the property owner be willing to deed restrict the property so that once this is built, this is it? There's not going to be any subdivision. There's not going to be any different or other development on the property such that all the free space is going to remain free space. Or is it just an argument that there's going to be all this free space if this is done? Yeah, I would love to have it that way because this is my 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 uh, vision for the property, and it's a hardship because if I subdivide it, and and right now they tell me if you subdivide it, the property is worth much more money because I can put three homes there. It's like forty thousand square foot of homes so or whatever it is. That would probably be something they recommend that I should do, but uh, I, I I don't see it that way. I like the property, and I would like to keep it in my family, and uh, and I love the nature the sort of around it, even the asha above it. It's just it's just beautiful, you know. And so that's it's probably not a smart decision from on my end. It's certainly a, um, a hardship in that sense from a money standpoint, but I'm willing to do that. Well, that's a hardship you're willing to accept if you can do this. Um, I mean, I, I, but I think it's admirable what you want to do here if you if you can do it. Um, well, so as, if we can get, if we can get to the point of approving this, will the property be deed restricted so that this is the, so that it cannot be subdivided, and there can't be more buildings put in the open space? Will that be something that we can have part of this? Who are you asking, Bruce? The applicant. Yeah. But either directly or through representative. I'm sorry, they, they keep you muting me. Um, yeah, it's difficult, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so no, uh, uh, like I said, I'm willing to do that uh, for sure. Uh, and, okay. Uh, okay, so, you know, here's what I'm, I'm going to throw it out. It's 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 not an easy one. Is is can can we get agreement on it being because we we can't ignore the words of the code. And I'm not suggesting we 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 claim that we're not ignoring them and really do. I'm not I'm not suggesting that by any means. But can we find it's a hardship that we've got a property that is capable of being subdivided, could be subdivided, would at if subdivided would result in three to four times as much development being permitted to be on this property, um, and yet they can't build the prop the, the development they want, which is one quarter or so of the full developable space if subdivided, and they're willing to as a as a bonus, I guess, as a benefit to the city, um, commit to all this free space. It doesn't affect the neighbor. It's it, it's not biologically problematic. The only issue we're faced with is this is the square footage. Can, can we legitimately get to finding that's a hardship? Because if we can, I'm inclined to do it. Bruce, I think I can help you with that. But I think Mikey's had his hand up for a while. Mikey? Uh, well, I had a question for Richard or maybe John. Um, if the applicant was to try and subdivide the property, what 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 would that process look like for this property for and say the goal was to achieve what what they are proposing but to split the lots to subdivide it what what would that look like the the issue with this lot and why i would be cautious in subdividing it is that it has a lot of esha on it and one of the requirements in our lip is that if you were to subdivide anything we do and that has esha that we don't create a subdivision that could have greater impacts to the ESHA than already exist. And so if we were to subdivide this into say two lots, they would need to one, demonstrate that the new building pad uh, that's created would not result, you know, and actually this would be for both lots to be truthful. They would need to demonstrate that building pads on both lots could be created without creating greater ESHA impacts than there already are. And then the second part of this that needs to be kept in mind is that for the creation of any new lot in our area, 
you also need to retire a lot. So they would also be required to one, create either donor lots or they would have to then purchase other lots somewhere in the Santa Monica mountains and uh, give those, uh, essentially make those available for uh, a government agency to uh, take and extinguish all development rights. So the ability to subdivide this property is not automatic. There would be some additional analysis uh, that I recommend that be done before uh, we're convinced that this could be subdivided. So it seems like the project, Richard, as I understand it, would not impact us because they're talking about redeveloping the original house lot, which I've been up there, it's not in Esha. And then the other part of it's already built. So I don't see any way in this particular case it could impact Esha. But so the concern that I have is that the way we look at Esha and new development is that if you were to demolish your site, uh, do complete demolition, you would need to demonstrate that the new house would not create a new ESHA impact. You're not automatically grandfathered uh, because the, the, uh, of the, the old development path. We're supposed to look at something anew. And so that that's what I'm getting at is that, yes, there is existing disturbance and there's quite a bit of it, but we would need to look at that ESHA line and come at this from the, the perspective of if in the future all of that development was uh, demolished, would they be able to put a new house back without the requirement of a variance or, or something of that nature that would essentially because they're impacting Esha? That, that, it, it's just some additional review that you know, was not done because this was not a subdivision project. Right. Thank you. I see Bruce, you've got your hand raised and Lauren has her hand raised. So uh, would you like to hear from Lauren first or would you like to speak right now, Bruce? You're, uh, you're muted, muted, Bruce. Consistent with my view that I expressed during council comments, I'm happy to hear from the applicant's representative first. Lauren, would you like to unmute? Um, yes. Um, so one of the other difficulties in subdividing the slot is um, we currently are on all tank system for our water and um, I actually have uh, approval to use a tank for the new house, but if it were subdivided, I would not be able to get approval for the new lot. And so to bring water to the property is um, over a half million dollars. Um, so that would be additional cost to subdivide this property. So there is a bit of a hardship there too, if we're required to do that. Yes. Thank you, Lauren. Bruce? So um, if I read the, the paperwork properly, the findings that staff is recommending we can't make or, or, or that, that aren't, that are, that we should reject are one, four, seven, and nine. Um, I've got no problem with finding four, seven, and nine. Four is that it won't be contrary. Granting this variance won't conflict with our, the general intent of our code, our objectives and policies, because for the reasons I already articulated, I don't, I don't think, I think that this is a technical problem, not a generic, uh, a general problem. Um, so I, I could make finding four. I don't know about others. I could make that finding. Finding seven, um, it says the variance request is consistent with the purposes and intent of the zone in which the site is located. Um, to me, that means, you know, th this is, this is a residential area. This is a home. It's a home with a lot of, um, extras, which are really nice, but it's a home. It's not like they're building a business there or something that's not zoned to be there. If it weren't for the size being too large, I couldn't, I don't think that we'd be being told that that finding shouldn't be made or couldn't be made. You know, others can tell me I'm wrong about that, but I could make finding seven, I think. Finding nine, the variance complies with all requirements of state and local law. Well, 
And, and the answer is the variance does not, well, of course it doesn't if it can't be granted. You know, so that comes back to whether we can other, make the other findings. But if we can make the findings needed for a variance, the variance does comply with the law because you wouldn't be looking, it, it must mean otherwise complies with the law if given the variance, because if it didn't mean that, if it meant every time you need a variance, you don't comply with the law, you'd never get a variance. So I can make those, I can make those findings. I can vote to make those findings. I come back to, it's the hardship issue. And I guess where I come out is, I would say I, I can, with a, with a straight face, say there is a hardship here, because it's, if it's not a unique piece of land, it's certainly an, a, a very unusual piece of land in, in the size, um, in the Esha. And it seems to me that it is a hardship to say to an, a property owner in these particular circumstances, you can't have this home, which by the way, the house itself, the dwelling portion of it isn't larger than it should be. It's really because if I understand correctly, the, this giant subterranean garage, among other things, which no one sees, it, that you can't do any of that because of this specific rule, but, he, but you could probably subdivide it in some way, maybe not three or four lots, but in some way that would give you more developable square footage than this, but we're just not going to let you do it this way. I, I, I can get there. I don't, maybe, maybe, maybe others can't, but I can get there. So I, I would, I, I'd like to approve this project. I really would. Um, but I wouldn't, wouldn't go so far as to violate the law. And I, I think we can get there. Maybe, we, maybe someone needs to use better words than I'm using to explain finding one, or maybe there aren't two other votes to get there. I don't know. That's it. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I think that my biggest snag with this is that if we, if we let them do it without getting a subdivision, we're giving them a benefit that their neighbor, that other people have not had. Uh, if, in my mind, if I own this property, I would, I would make the first five acres be the five acres closest to the street. And I would, on the back, almost 20 acres, I would just, I would build the house and the other improvements that they're talking about on here. And I would have exactly what I wanted to get, end up with. The problem is that I would, we've heard just now that, that that other option results in an extension of the water line, which is a half million dollar proposition. We know also that a subdivision is gonna require the buying and, and uh, deed restricting of some land in the somewhere else in the Santa Monica Mountains because we have a limit on the total number of lots in the Santa Monica Mountains. And that's why you have to retire one if you create another another lot. And that is another, say, minimum of uh, probably 150,000 or something like that, plus the time it would take. So there is a benefit that they're being given. Uh, I, I, I don't, it's kind of shame that I can't think of a way to get them there without forcing them to go through that path if I was trying to get to where they want to go. Bruce? You, you're muted. You're muted. Thank you. You're, you're, you're talking about two related but, but different concepts. One is the, is there a hardship? The other is, are, would we be creating a precedent or giving them some benefit? Um, put aside for the moment the, is there a hardship? I mean, I've already articulated as best I can why I think there could be. I get your point that you don't want to give a benefit, at least not for free. I thought the deed restriction concept helps there because you're not giving a benefit that no one else got because no one else is giving deed restrictions on 15 acres of land or whatever this is that, that is going to become permanently open space in Malibu. And if someone else came with that same deal, I'd give them that same benefit. So, I mean, have you thought about that? Uh, I don't think you're asking me, but I'm telling you, I, I have thought about that. And I think that that is, I think if we were to require that uh, a deed restriction that lasts a hundred years, 
that prevents the property from being subdivided for that amount of time, that that would be a benefit to the community. And if proposition, or I'm sorry, if is that Senate Bill 9 passes, right. then uh, I think, I don't know if that would invalidate that restriction or not, but that's- uh, I have a hard I time believing that. I, I would think that that is a, uh, something they're giving up and a benefit that the city is getting. That's my thought. I'm curious, why did you say 100 years? Is there some legal restriction that would- Make it 99, make it 50. No, no, no. I, I, is there some legal prohibition against making it forever? Is this like a rule of perpetuities or something? I, I, I think that there, you can't have a lease that's over 99 years because of the, the law of prep perpetuities. And I don't think that, uh, I don't believe in making people two generations from now unable to, uh, to come to terms with whatever conditions have changed in America and in, in Malibu. So that's, that was my thought on that. There is no magic no, to, to, the, to the number 100 that I'm aware of. Okay. Steve. Richard, if we were to approve this with whatever process we're going on here, how would that impact other development projects in Malibu? Would it open a door for other people to come in to do the same types of things? I'm certain, I mean, folks are already trying to do that. I met with somebody about two weeks ago who maxed out the square footage on the property for the home, but now they want a covered patio. Right. Uh, actually, two folks, I should say, uh, two, uh, about a month ago for one and a couple weeks ago for the other. So there are definitely folks that have asked for additional square footage. You know, my general direction to anybody who's always asked that question is that's what we have the neighborhood standards process for in our code. It's that if you're in a neighborhood where there are county homes that are all larger than you, uh, that that's why I, to me, I believe that in 1996, the council put that mechanism in there. Uh, we did look at neighborhood standards for this. It, it wouldn't help. Uh, okay. Yes, right now, I was unable to find any evidence of the, the city ever granting such a variance. Uh, so this would definitely add to it. However, you know, variances are unique and, you know, it's something that uh, the council or commission look at, but uh, this would be definitely something new. Yeah. And that's sort of my concern, Bruce, that, you know, we're opening a door that I don't know what the impacts are going to be down the line. I, I, you know, I don't know how many people are going to try and do this. Uh, you know, we had an argument or discussion earlier on about people building large houses and the impact on Malibu. Um, you know, we, we lost that, but there was some discussion that says, you, you know, we've we got some rules and we want to stay within the rules. Uh, so I, I'm inclined to go with the um, conclusion that the staff came up with that it would grant a benefit. Uh, nobody else around there has got the same process. So I don't see how I can vote for this thing. If it flies in the face of our LIP and the rules we have. Thank you, Steve. Mikey's had his hand in the air for a while. I've spoken a lot, though, too. Um, so in my heart of hearts, I want to approve this because it's a great property. It's a great project. Um, it's, it's, it's really fits the neighborhood. It's not huge. It's not big. Um, and not that it matters, but Clausen and, Klaus and, and Lauren are quality people. And, you know, Klaus is probably the one person I'm pretty sure that's faster than me downhill on a mountain bike. That's a whole nother story. Um, impressive athlete. But I have, I'm stuck on three places. And, and I bring that up so Bruce can maybe take a stab at him. Looking at LIP section 13.26, um, denying the variance would not result in depriving the property of privileges enjoyed by other property in the vicinity and under identical zoning classification to RR5. So I'm stuck on that one. I'm stuck on I have number three and under section C here on the resolution. I think maybe I'm looking at the planning commission one. I'm not sure which was the resolution. Granting the variance will 
can constitute a special privilege to the applicant. I can't see how we're not, even though I think logically, not by code, but logically we should, <laughs> because we'd be doing the city a favor, but it is, a, I don't know how it's not a special privilege and I'm open to feedback on that. And then of course, I just come up against the other hard part is just the maximum TBSF of 11172. Um, so those three things are the ones that other than that, I am fully able to approve this project. And it's a great project, but that's where I'm stuck right now. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce? All right, so let me take a stab at, oh. let me take a stab at seeing if I can help you, Mikey, if we get the same place. Before I do that, so with respect to Steve's point, I always worry about the, the unknown, the, you know, what are the unintended consequences of doing something? What are, what, what precedents are being set? I don't see this as being the, the situation that's going to then open up someone who's got a six acre piece of land to, to now say I should get 1.5, 1.2 times what I'm otherwise entitled to, because this is unique. Or, it, or if it's not unique, it's, it's gonna be a rare situation where we're gonna have a property of this size and this nature. So I, I, I really not, unless somebody tells me there's a lot of other properties like this and that it's, it's not, it's wrong that this is quasi unique. That's what helps me with the, what are we doing by way of precedent? So Mikey, I, I think that's kind of the answer to each of the things. Now, the, the first one I tried to write quickly, what, what was the words of 13.2.6 that, that was troubling you? Mikey? You need that again, thank you. Yeah, that darn button. Uh, denying the variance would not result in depriving the property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity and under okay. identical zoning classification. Okay, I got it. So, so it, it's the same answer for that issue and the special privilege issue. And then I'll turn to the TBSF, which is the answer is there aren't other similar properties. So those words are kind of hollow because it, it's not that there's five others that have the same situation that aren't getting the same benefit. This one's, it, again, if it's not unique, it's sufficiently different that it's not like we're, there's not 10 or 15 examples of someone who wanted the same thing and couldn't get it um, or that there even will be another 10 that will want the same thing and won't get it or maybe they will because this will be a precedent for them. But we don't have a history, maybe Richard can tell us we do and I'm wrong, we don't have a history of people with a property like this looking for this kind of a arrangement, especially with the deed restriction as part of it, and it was denied. So it's not a special privilege because it's not, it's not something that was denied other people and it's being given to these, and it's not even something that's come up. So every time you got a sui generis situation or an issue of first impression, of course it's gonna be new and different but that shouldn't stop it from being considered on its merit. That, 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 that's my, my effort to answer those two. I don't know if that gets you there or not. As far as the TDSF, well, the answer to that one is simply, if it can be varied, then it can be varied. I mean, we wouldn't have the problem in the first place if the TDSF weren't limiting. But the, uh, so the other, I say that's not a factor at all. We, already, we all know that's, that's the problem. It doesn't meet, it doesn't fit within the existing statutory TDSF, but it can be varied if we can make all the other findings. So yes, you're right. It's above the TDSF, that's a given. The question really is, can you get, can you be satisfied on the first two that you identified by the fact that it's, it is a special property. It's not that there are a whole bunch of others that were denied this benefit and therefore they're being treated specially. They're being treated differently because they are in a different situation. That's my, that's Richard, the way I look at it. Richard, has there, has there been, have we ever as a city since it had granted an excess of the TDSF and we found a variance for it? Not that I could find evidence of. And how many properties in the larger size are there in Malibu? I don't know, what's, how many properties over 10 or 15 acres are there? I have no idea. I, I would need to do some additional research for you. I, mean, I can think of a handful of large properties, 
Um, but you know, they're they're all different, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Some of them, I'm sure, have a lot of unbuildable, just like this one does. They're the side uh, of mountains, or you know, right. where they are on the beach. Steve. Yeah, my. Am I muted here? Yeah. Uh, you know, to Bruce, this thing is, is a special property. Everybody who's going to try and build a house bigger than the TDSF is going to make an argument that their, their property is special. Right? And it's going to be, you know, now how are we going to define special? So it's just, I think we're opening a door that I'm not sure we understand what the impacts are going to be. I think that door is in a wall that is a pretty unique wall. They've got 900 feet of frontage on PCH. And then if you look at the depth in relationship to that, it's amazing. Okay. I think the city would benefit more from having it be one part, one property for the next 100 years, the next 500 years, whatever you want to do. And, and make it so that it would be very difficult. Most people are of a mind with a piece of property. They want to do things to make it easier to sell when, for when they go out. Because none of us live forever, said, said the guy who's thinking about that stuff lately. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's uh, I don't want to make improvements that are not, that are so focused that nobody wants to, buy it from me when it's time for me to go to Leisure World. So uh, I think that there's a certain amount of commitment and sacrifice if, if somebody makes that kind of commitment. But it's, uh, and I think that's kind of where Bruce is going with yeah, this. Client, and represented lots of clients who don't care about 100 years from now. They want what they want now and they're willing to sacrifice the, the dollars to get it. So right. that's what I see. Yeah. Karen, have you had any thoughts on this? Uh, you know, I've, I've already said uh, what I thought about it. Um, I will tell you, I do not want to set this precedent. Okay. I can read the room as well as anybody. So uh, if somebody wants to make a motion, I'd love to hear it. I, oh, go ahead, Steve. You're muted. You're muted. I'll make a motion to deny the product based, project based upon the staff recommendation. Is there a second? second. I'll second. There's a motion and a second to deny the project. If I may jump in real quick, Mayor, would this be deny with or without prejudice? That would affect the applicant's ability to resubmit on that property. I would think without prejudice would be the kind thing to do. Is that acceptable to the maker? Is that going to, is that like the re, remand? Yeah. Right. I, I, how, how, I'm not, am I remanding it back like we're doing with the other one? Is that what No, that, it's not remanding. It's, it's what? Richard, would you like to explain what, what without prejudice is? Certainly. If it's denied without prejudice, then tomorrow, the applicant could make a submittal uh, for a similar proje a project, you know, a new home. If it's denied with prejudice, they will have to wait one year before submitting a similar application. Okay, so it's just the timing, but they, they have to put a new application together, which is the timing when they can do that. Right? I, then I, I'm no problem with the prejudice, though. Just what, what's the source of that one year delay? What, is that a statute? Yes, it's in our codes. Thank you. So we're agreed that it's without prejudice then, yes, Steve? Yes, yes, absolutely. Karen, will you accept that? Yes. Okay, we have a we have a motion and a second with the denial without prejudice. Would you like to call the roll, Kelsey? Council Member Uring? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Reluctantly, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Mayor Grisanti? I'm reluctantly, yes, as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm sorry that it was not uh, the outcome you were looking for. Uh, I think it would be, does anybody want to take a break now or should we go to 4B? Looks like 4B. Okay, item 4B is, uh, sorry, Senate Bill SB 1383, Organic Waste Reduction Ordinance and Resolution to Initiate Amendment to Title 17 Zoning of the Malibu Municipal Code. Perfect. Staff will have a report for us. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and council members. My name is Christine Shen, Environmental Sustainability Analyst and the city's lead for the planning and implementation of this state's new waste reduction law. I'll be presenting on the SB 1383 ordinance and a resolution to initiate a zoning code amendment in order to comply with the state's requirement. Next slide, please. Before we begin, here is the presentation outline. I'll introduce organic waste, its impacts on climate change, the SB 1383 key dates, requirements, and impacts. Then we'll move on to the SB 1383 ordinance and the model water efficient landscaping ordinance resolution to initiate a zoning code amendment. Next slide, please. So SB 1383 is the state's most ambitious waste reduction law in the last 30 years, and it addresses organic waste and food recovery in California. For the purposes of SB 1383, organic waste refers to green waste, wood waste, food waste, and fibers. And as you can see from the pie chart, organic waste compromises, comprises two thirds of our waste stream. And the goal of this regulation is to reduce the amount of organic waste that we send to the landfills. SB 1383 also requires that California recover 20% of currently disposed edible food. And what we know is that one in five children go hungry every night in California. So to help alleviate this, this problem, the state is hoping to redirect perfectly edible food that is currently being disposed to feed those in need. Additionally, for every two and a half tons of food rescued, that's the equivalent of taking one car off the road for a year. Next slide. And that's because landfilling organic waste leads to the anaerobic breakdown of that material, which creates methane. Since landfills are the third largest producer of methane, SB 1383 is designed to reduce global warming gases like methane which are the most potent and short-lived. Reducing this gas now through actions like organic, organic waste recycling and edible food recovery will significantly reduce emissions and reduce the impacts of climate change in our lifetime. Next slide. SB 1383 establishes aggressive organic waste reduction targets. By 2025, Californians must reduce organic waste disposal by 75%. Also by 2025, we're required to increase our edible food recovery by 20%. Next slide. To achieve those targets, the city is required to resource through funding and staff time, the following programs. Provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses, this will involve coordinating with our residents' businesses as well as our haulers and the county. We also need to establish an edible food recovery program, conduct education and outreach to all um, organic waste generators, procure recyclable and recycled paper and recovered organic products such as mulch and compost. Also need to secure access to recycling and edible food recovery capacity, as well as monitor compliance and conduct enforcement. So to do all of this, we are required by the state to adopt an ordinance that is consistent with these requirements before 2022. Next slide. This law extends beyond our waste haulers and environmental program staff, and we're working to make sure that each department will understand will understand how SB 1383 impacts their work, especially since the record keeping and reporting requirements extend to all departments. 
Next slide. So this slide shows the key dates that the city needs to remember to help the state reach its waste reduction goals. Starting on January 2022, Cal Recycle can begin enforcement actions on jurisdictions like Malibu if we don't implement the following programs and activities. In 2024, Malibu will be required to take enforcement against non-compliant entities within the city. And we plan to minimize the enforcement through education and outreach. Next slide. So this slide shows how businesses and residents will be impacted by the state's organic waste reduction laws. Businesses will need to have organic recycling service by October of this year, which involves new containers being delivered to the site for organic recycling. Employees must also be trained on proper sorting of materials like organics, and some food service establishments in the city will need to participate in an edible food recovery program. In terms of residential service, based on what we're hearing from our solid waste haulers, residents will not need to receive new carts for organic recycling and will be asked to sort the organic waste in their existing carts. Next slide. Education and outreach will be critical so that the community embraces these new regulations and the benefits it brings to the community and the environment. The SB 1383 regulations will go into effect on January 1st, 2022, and this slide shows our outreach plan for the rest of the year. Our goal is to get the word out in as many ways and as early as possible. Next slide. Now that we've reviewed the SB 1383 and its impacts, we'll move on to the two proposed ordinances. Attachment one of this item is the SB 1383 ordinance, which adds a new organic waste disposal reduction section to the city's existing solid waste municipal code. The ordinance addresses the regulatory requirements the city needs to enforce on others, including requirements for generators to participate in organic waste collection, and commercial edible food gener generators to recover edible food. Next slide. In addition to an organic waste reduction ordinance, the city also has to adopt an ordinance that requires compliance with the state's Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance, or MWILO. MWILO requires new construction and landscaping projects to meet water efficient landscaping standards for compost and mulch application. Instead of including these um, landscaping ordinance requirements in our solid waste municipal code, we thought it was more appropriate to include this in the landscape water conservation and fire protection chapter of the city's zoning code. Next slide. So in conclusion, the recommended actions for this item are to meet the state's requirements by directing staff to schedule a second reading and adoption of the SB 1383 ordinance and adopting a resolution to initiate a zoning code amendment for M. Wheelo. This concludes my presentation and I am available to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go out of order for once and just say it's it's apparent that what we are doing here is primarily a formality. Uh, we're required to pass this law and, and the other one. So uh, we might wanna ask some questions about the impact. I think that personally, I believe that this is probably gonna drive up prices at markets, which are qualified as, are designated as generators here. Uh, so, but public comment, um, Paul. Is there any public comment? Thank you, Mikey. We do not have any speakers for this item. Wow. Uh, Bruce raised his hand. Would you like to speak, Bruce? I, I was raising my hand to say what Mikey said. Thank you. Would someone like to make a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to approve this and just say that how impressed I continue to be with, uh, uh, with the whole team there, with Christine, with Yolanda, with everyone there, it, 
You guys are doing an amazing job. This is a really big lift, and and I'm I'm so excited when you told us how excited you are to to make this program effective and and really um, I don't know bring it forward. That was really great to hear because I know it's a really big lift for the city, and um, I don't know it just makes me really happy, and I'm really glad to bring this forward. Thank you. I will we have second. a motion. We have a motion in a second. Bruce, I see you raising your hand. Here, well, I had raised my hand a second, but um, oh, sorry. That, that's okay. Um, I, I agree with what Mikey. I concur with what Mikey said about um, this being a, a really good presentation and and um, ordinance. And I agree with what Paul had to say, which is that you know I would have a lot of questions about this if it really were something we had any control over. But we kind of have no choice but to do this because if I'm if I understand it correctly, state law mandates this. So it seems like a no brainer because of that. I, I think there are some policy implications that the state should have been asking, but right. we'll be on that. Steve? Just one quick one. Uh, Christine, do you have any idea what this may cost the city to implement? Um, that's a good question. Well, we need almost a whole new employee. Uh, yeah, I'm just sorry. Go yes, ahead. yes, good evening. Um, implementation, um, it's going to be requiring a lot of outreach for the community, like we mentioned before. We are excited, um, but we understand this is going to take a lot of staff uh, time to, to make a smooth implementation and also to have the community embrace it and, and the education that goes along with this. Uh, Christine Shen has done an amazing job at helping us um, planning uh, this ordinance. He, she has worked since the beginning of the year with Call Recycle and the city attorney's office. The, um, there was a slide that she showed on the aggressive outreach that we intended to do. Quantify how much money is going to be, um, how, much, how much is going to cost the city. Um, we don't have those numbers for you, but I can um, mention that one of the uh, one of the requirements and that this is state mandate is for the city to to have more recycled paper. And so we're we're working already with our assistant city manager and the different departments for cost and possibly before this is implemented, uh, we will bring it back to the environmental sustainability committee and we'll kind of give you a lot of in information and update. We're trying to meet with you guys every uh, two months. So to keep you informed and also keep the community informed. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 you know, well, I echo Mikey's comments that I did this when we had the first presentation. You guys have done a superb job. And my question was not, I mean, I know there's stuff we're gonna have to do, but we've also got a budget issue that we talked about a little bit earlier. And, you know, I just, I'm just trying to get a heads up down the line. So as you guys get that tied down a little bit better, uh, it'd be great if you could let us know. But I, I got no problem with this project. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see Bruce's hand up, is up again. Yeah, thank you. So just a thought is maybe we can um, encourage a environmental group um, or a homeless group quick for the food issue part of it to um, take the, uh, the laboring or on community um, information and helping to get this done. Good thought. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Mayor Gasanti, before we, I think you're going to ask for a roll call, if I could read the title of the ordinance. If you could do so, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Ordinance 48 is an ordinance of the City of Malibu adding Chapter 8.34, Mandatory Organic Waste Disposal Reduction. Title 8, Health and Safety with the Malibu Municipal Code for Mandatory Organic Waste Disposal Reduction. Thank you. Very nicely done, John. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, I believe the next item, 4C, is a related item. I don't think it's going to require a second uh, presentation, is it, Christine? 
I just, no, it will not. Talking points, uh, just to summarize what the uh, what what it is. It will take me five minutes. Please um, do, Yolanda. Yes, thank you, sir. So this evening we're bring to you the first reading of the solid way or solid way. Uh, just to make it clear, the solid waste ordinance is already a chapter that is existing under the municipal code under section 8.32. This was codified and adopted since 1993 and it has not been updated. As a result of this new solid waste regulations and state mandate, such as the SB 1383, we saw the necessity to update this uh, chapter. And just briefly, let me let you know what are the proposed changes that we are bringing to you? We have updated the general definitions of the chapter and combined them with the new necessary definitions for the city compliance on 1883, 1383. We have rearranged uh, several sections of this code for a, for a better flow and understanding. We have consolidated related sections and finally, we have removed outdated sections which do not apply any longer. So this evening, we recommend uh, the uh, council direct staff to schedule the second reading and adoption of this updated ordinance for 89. And that concludes my, my presentation. Yolanda, that was the quickest five minutes I've ever heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion in favor? Mayor uh, Grisanti, I just yes. want to note for anyone watching and wondering, we don't have any speakers signed up for this item. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really falling flat on that. Uh, so, is there anyone who would like to make a motion? I will move to approve this item. Is there a second? I'll second it. The motion and a second to approve the solid waste ordinance. Uh, I can read the title again, Mayor Grisanti. Please. Ordinance number 489 is an ordinance of the city of Malibu determining the project is category, categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and amending chapter 8.32, solid waste and recyclable materials of Title VIII, health and safety of the Malibu, Malibu Municipal Code. Thank you. Thank you, John. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll, please? Council Member Ferris? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. The next item is 4D, a request to remand coastal development permit number 17-104 and associated discretionary request to the Planning Commission We have a staff report. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. If I may have my presentation, please. What you have before you is a request regarding a project that is currently on appeal. <clears throat> and depending on what the council's direction is tonight, this will either uh, be heard by the council or will be remanded back to the Planning Commission, whichever is the the council's uh, choice. If I may have the next slide, please. This project is located along Naranda Lane on a currently vacant parcel. The project is located in the eastern, or excuse me, the western end of the town. If I may have the next slide, please. This project uh, was originally heard by the Planning Commission in November of 2020. At that time, the the, uh, the public hearing was open and the item continued to a date uncertain. There was some direction given to the applicant as well as the property owners over some concerns that the commissioner sh uh, shared. At the March 15th hearing, the item was presented to the Planning Commission again. At that time, uh, the applicant did not make any of the the, the uh, changes that were requested by the Planning Commission. It was roughly the same design. The Planning Commission then directed staff to return with a resolution for the denial of the project. 
And then in April, the applicant did file a timely appeal of the Planning Commission's uh, action. And then in early of June 2021, the, uh, the applicant met with staff to show us some, some changes to the project, which were in response to the comments made by the Planning Commission. If I may have the next slide, please. I, I'm roughly going to explain what the changes are. The, the reason why we don't have anything too specific here is because tonight is really just a question of whether or not the council desires that we move forward with the appeal or do we remand this back to the planning commission given the scope of the changes and allow this to be vetted at the planning commission uh, prior to being heard uh, by the council. So these are just kind of a more a higher level uh, summation of what has been changed in the project. The eaves and walkways were removed from the project. The square footage was reduced. There was a concern about construction on and near one-to-one -one slopes and the project's been pulled back from that. The swimming pool was a contentious item at both hearings. That's been addressed. And also the size of the basement's been reduced and also how they're gonna construct the home. There was a concern about construction management and that too has, um, there's been some changes to it. If I may have the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the next steps for this project are, the applicant is going to make a formal submittal of their revised project plans. Uh, they'll be at that time paying a revision fee for the project. And they're also going to have to pay any other fees that are associated with the other city agencies, such as public works, environmental health, or geology, looking at the application to see if the changes uh, have changed that are previous determinations or if any new conditioning conditions are required. If this does go back to the planning commission, there'll be a noticing fee attached to it too. And regardless of if the appeal is heard here or remanded back, the staff will be preparing a staff report. Um, you know, the council, is, since this is a de novo hearing, the city has a policy that does allow applicants to redesign their project between the planning commission and the city council. Um, changes can be made to the project. We've never, as a city, required anybody to uh, withdraw their application at that point and submit a new application. In the past, when these items come before the planning commission, or excuse me, the city council on a redesign to address the issues that were raised. Oftentimes the public hearing is opened. Discussion takes place and in instances is remanded back to the planning commission. And in fact, we have an item we're gonna be preparing for the planning commission hearing that was remanded back by the council. Uh, by doing what I'm attempting to do here this evening is just, as I mentioned, stay on the high level and just discuss the remand because if any of the actual projects, de de detailed project aspects get discussed, and then there is a decision to remand the project back, uh, there could be uh, Brown Act concerns with uh, in-depth discussion taking place, uh, predeterminations if it should come back for some reason. Uh, if I may have my next slide, please. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're looking for the council's direction here on what the council desires. And so we can either uh, take the project back to the planning commission as revised or bring it forward to the city council as revised on appeal. Uh, it all depends on the, the wishes of the council. The applicant as well as the property owners, I believe are available uh, for any questions and I am as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Do we have any public comment? The only people we have signed up are the applicant and the property owners. I think if we hear from Vitus first, he may be able to help us. Uh, we haven't been able to find the property owners in the meeting, but he might have direction. Good evening, council members. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Yes, I wanted to point out that when we went before the planning commission in November of last year, we came away with the impression that the important points here were to avoid construction on one-to-one -one slopes and to provide a cohesive construction management plan. And both Richard and Jessica Thompson came away with a similar impression that those were the key items. And we did address those. 
But in the second, the subsequent hearing, they brought up points of the size of the home and where it could be seen from, and that they could not make the findings regarding protection of ESHA and other uh, special considerations we were asking for. So this is really our chance to completely revise the project, which we have done, and we've revised the visual impact uh, extensively here. It is no longer the architectural home that the uh, clients hired me to design. We've gotten rid of all the eaves, all the decorative sort of elements of this house and stripped it down. So it's really 50% of the structure that you used to see based on original design has now been stripped away. And we have also uh, redesigned the uh, construction techniques themselves and met with the fire department and with the fuel modification unit on site, uh, reducing the fuel modification area by 66%. And uh, this is no matter what house you put there, I don't think you can create a smaller impact on ESHA. That was one of the two key points here. So I, I'm not gonna go through the details of the house, but I just wanted to stress that we did not ignore what the planning commission asked us to revise at the November hearing. And I don't even think we misunderstood. I think there was just poor communication. So we've gone back and listened to everything in detail and we have greatly reduced the impact of this project. We'd love to bring it back before the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Vinus. Are there any, uh, does anybody from the council want to weigh in? Mikey? I, okay. Why, why are we hearing this? <laughs> I don't under quite understand. I really don't. I talked to John Cotty today about it. Um, I, I kind of get it and I kind of don't. I just would like a better understanding. I've never seen a request to rep remand before. Maybe they've come in the past and I just didn't notice them. But uh, why, why are we hearing this when, I don't know. It just seems odd to me. Seems odd that it's taking up time on our calendar um, when it just, at this point, clearly seems like a planning commission issue. Except I guess we have the right to, you know, be nasty and deny it for some reason. So I, I just would like an explanation of that. Certainly. So the reason why we're doing this is because of the redesign. Uh, since the, the applicant is proposing a redesign, the, the council in the past has uh, voiced some comments that redesigns have not been vetted by the planning commission. And so in some cases, those projects then get remanded back to the planning commission. So this was an effort to uh, essentially, one, try to address that concern, also a staff resources concern, uh, rather than prepare a report analyzing the appeal, um, in response to this new redesign, in case it is just going to be remanded back to the Planning Commission, we're also trying to avoid uh, those resources. It, 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 so it's an effort to try to make this a bit more streamlined. But then we're really not allowed to discuss it because of potential Brown Act violations. So it puts us in a really interesting position to have something to discuss that we're not supposed to discuss too much. So I, I just find it odd, that's all. I'm not saying you've done anything wrong. It just seems like uh, very, I don't know. I don't know. Just haven't seen this before. That's Council, all. I see Councilmember Yearing's hands up, but if I could address that as well, I, you could make the point that this is following a denial from the Planning Commission, and were it to simply go back, it would have that timing constraint that the last appeal might have had. So by you remanding it, they can immediately have that project heard. They don't have to have a year for resubmittal. So it gives some, some blessing to the idea that the, the project can be heard immediately rather than waiting a year for, for, for it to be just flowing from a denial from the Planning Commission. Thank you, John. Bruce, would you like to weigh in? Well, Steve has his hands up. I don't mind waiting for that. I'm you. sorry, I, Steve? Uh, let me make sure I'm unmuted. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't, there was an email that came out from uh, Jessica Thompson that said the, the plans for this project have not yet been submitted. Is that correct, Richard? That is correct. That we met with the applicant and they showed us their draft revised plans. So we don't know what the applicant's gonna put in there yet. 
We don't know. Correct. We don't have a final set of plans. We don't, we don't know. Right. Okay. Second thing is, when this goes, if, if they had to go back and, and we they came to us, we heard the appeal, we denied it, they'd have to go back and start over again. Right? They would okay. submit an application. If you do the, and so they'd have to get in line with whatever other projects are coming down the pike and, and get behind those and, and get in front of the planning commission. If we ran this, we're putting them back on the front of the line, are we not? That is not necessarily in front of the line because we still have more to do, but they would be closer to the top. Yes. So who are we, who are we putting them ahead of? Who are the people that have done their job, that have not got, that, you know, listened to whatever the, the rules were, did it the right way, and are waiting to get a hearing in front of the planning commission? Who are we putting these people ahead of? I, I couldn't answer that question because, as I mentioned, we still have to prepare a report for this. Right. And but why is it good to do that? Why do, Why are we going to, what What do these guys, what have these guys done that deserve to be put ahead of people who have been working for two years or three years to get their project heard? Why is this a better project than, than theirs? It, it's not that it's a better project. It's for the points that I mentioned earlier, which is we have had a, a number of projects be rebanded back to the Planning Commission. They've been discussed at the council level, comments have been made, and then a final motion made to send it back, to, as I mentioned. And some of those comments could preclude, uh, they could be shown as a bias if the project comes back to the city council uh, on appeal. And so this is really an effort as to address that, to address previous comment from the council about folks being allowed to make changes between the planning commission hearing and the city council hearing and then lastly a allocation of staff resources uh, for more efficiency to prepare a staff report for the city council does not necessarily prepare us for a staff report for the planning commission the council report is going to identify uh, a number of items with the appeal we would spend time doing that whereas if at the planning commission we do not discuss the merits of the appeal we in, we spend our focus on the staff report uh, talking about compliance with the city's LCP and MMC. So we would be uh, essentially avoiding the staff time associated with a council report that no action would be taken on. I mean, the other way to avoid the council report, these people have filed an appeal. If they've got a different project, if they want to get back heard in front of the planning commission, why don't they just withdraw their appeal? Go back, start over, and put it in front of the planning commission like everybody else would do. And that's a choice they have, or there are other choices that we, uh, you know, depending on the outcome tonight, we would bring forward this revised project to the council for its consideration on appeal. And so you tell, so it is a, a policy of the city council that someone can get a project denied at the planning commission level, and they can put a whole new project together, which it sounds like they're this is what they're doing, and bring that to the city council and ask us to approve that. Is that correct? They can make revisions to the project to address the grievances heard, uh, whether those are grievances uh, from the planning commission, or they may tweak heights or setbacks to address the concerns raised by, uh, say it's a neighbor appealing the project. They may change the project to address the neighbor's concerns uh, between the planning commission stage and the city council. And there's there's no limit as terms of, of the number of changes they can make. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing that says, you know, it's gotta be substantially the same as it came in. Maybe you tweak it, but, but they can change anything. Steve, I think the whole point is that they're making changes that the planning commission asked them to make. Right, let's, then they should go, then, okay. They should have done that. Typically, in, in, in a, John, Paul, just said, typically what the planning commission does, before they make a decision, they will go to the applicant and say, as opposed to having a vote on this, you want to take it back and make changes to accommodate what we said. I think that these people got offered that. Is that not right, Richard? That is correct. They were offered that opportunity. The chair, I believe, in my opinion, made it very clear as to what was about to happen and the steps moving forward. Yeah. So 
Okay, I I got what I need. Bruce. Yeah, so I'll, I'll follow up on that a little. Um, so that, that was important for me to understand is whether they were offered the opportunity to make these changes and accepted it or rejected it. Uh, where does this policy of permitting changes between the time of a denial by the planning commission and the time of presentation to the city council? Where where's that written down or in our? It's not. I know it's not a city council policy. I couldn't find it when I looked through the policies. Where does it come from? I'm not aware of it being in writing. It's a, pra a perhaps practice would be a better word to use. Uh, since 2004, it's when I started with the city. Uh, that is a practice that I have seen the planning department in their presentations to the council uh, allow for. If we were to require folks to uh, essentially withdraw their application and start over if they uh, had if they didn't make any changes, then I think we'd have a large number of projects that you know folks would end up having to withdraw because the, the truth is a lot of folks want to make changes because there's a lot of money invested in this and time and they I think would rather just instead of fighting the neighbors or whoever uh, try to give them some sort of concession and, and a way to make this move forward and also this practice has been rooted in the fact that it is a de novo hearing if we were to be uh, essentially picking up um, and limited to the same uh, objections and all that was raised in, in the in the first hearing, then you know, changes couldn't be made. But uh, the city looks at these as de novo, and it's a, a fresh new look at the project. So, Rich, Richard, you're a lawyer. That that's a de novo hearing means the the deciding body looks at the exact same record and makes its own decision without giving any discretion whatsoever or, or weight to the lower body's decision. It's not a new hearing where you can put together a new project or you can put in a whole bunch of new evidence. And that's what happens at the original hearing. And I have, I have a real problem with the fact that, especially since the planning commission gives people the opportunity, which I don't think they have to give them, to say, do you want to withdraw your project because we're obviously going to reject it and make some changes and come back to us. When someone says, no, I'm going to go forward with my appeal, I think they're stuck with their appeal. And I don't understand why it's our decision to make whether they should get to remand or whether they should go forward. It sounds to me like they're withdrawing their appeal. I mean, if they want to go forward with their project and we may grant it, we may deny it, but do the same thing they did at the end of the day with the Planning Commission, that's what they should do. But they shouldn't come to us and say we'd like to we'd like to get your permission to now go back and take the opportunity to take what we were offered, but we made a decision not to. That it, it to me, I I want to see people get their projects done. If they're if they're appropriate projects, I want to see less delay. I want to see people getting through the process. But this is gaming the system. This is this is someone who had every opportunity to get their project approved, was even told that they needed to make changes to get it approved by the planning commission and then and said no we want to go forward with the way it is got the denial that they were told they were going to get and now they're having buyers remorse i guess or sellers remorse whatever the term is it doesn't seem right to me so i am opposed to remanding this and oh, the other thing is what's the point of having a one year moratorium rule if it doesn't really exist if every time somebody wants to make changes after they're going to get a denial we're just going to do it without prejudice or remand so there really is no one year moratorium unless you're giving up, in which case you don't need to have a moratorium. So I don't think a remand is appropriate. I think if the applicant wants to withdraw their appeal and go fall, you know, fall on their sword before the planning commission and ask for them to hear them again, get in the right line, get it done, or tell us they want to go forward with this project and we're going to consider this project, not a different project. That's where I come out. Thank you, Bruce. Do Mikey or Karen want to weigh in? Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make one. I'd like to make a motion that we remand this to the Planning Commission. Is there a second? I will I'll second it. Purpose. I will second it. Um, I think it is an interesting situation, and uh, I hear the other other counselors' opinions. Um, you know, I know I know the architect well. I don't. 
think he, I don't know him to play games. I don't want to be frivolous. And I think he's, you know, a stand up guy from everything I've known all, all the years. I just think it, it is a little odd the way this came, but um, I'm going to go with the staff recommendation. Well, I guess that wasn't a recommendation, huh? was there? Well, the staff recommendation was to remand. Yeah, okay. I'm going to follow the staff recommendation on it. So we have a motion and a second. Steve, you would like to discuss? I, yeah, I, Mikey, if we do this, how many other architects you think will take advantage of this process? It's a very fair question. It does seem like uh, an I mean, odd process. You, you, yeah, if I'm an architect, this is what I'm going to do. Right? Why follow, you know, I get shot down over there. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to do something different. I'll bring it up. I mean, we're just, we're, I, don't, I don't I just think it's it's opening a door for architects to play games. And I think we got enough of that going on. I just don't think it's a good idea. That, that raises the question if the goal here is is to uh, end up with a project the planning commission likes, or is the goal here to punish people? I think the goal is to end up, end up with something the planning commission likes and will approve personally. I, I don't disagree, but what we're doing, we're punishing okay. the other people that are waiting in line right now to get in front of the planning commission by putting these guys ahead of them for, for no reason. No reason. They had a chance. They gave it up. Thank you, Steve. Bruce? So I, I see your I hand. I, yeah, thank you. I, th I think I know where the vote's going to go, but I'll just say whatever we do on this, I would like us to, to bring back at some and consider whether we should have a practice of letting people change their projects on appeal. Because to me, I, I didn't know that existed. I think that that's bad practice. I think that you, you present your project, you're given an opportunity to make changes if the planning commission doesn't like it. You you either make them or you don't make them. And then if you want to appeal, you have the right to appeal, but you don't get to appeal a different project. You get to appeal the project that you presented. So I, I, I would like to see us make it clear that that's not going to be a practice that we're going to allow. And that's not um, prejudicial or unfair to the applicants. They have every opportunity to put forward the project they think they're entitled to and want to proceed with. But if they're told it's not going to work, they don't. They shouldn't appeal it and then, but change it at the same time. It, there's a disconnect. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? Oh, Karen. Uh, Karen has her hand up. Thank you, Mikey. I know you served on the planning commission for, I think, about seven years. Steve, I'm not sure how long you served. Some number of years. Four. Four. So, as Mikey said, this this is not a, a, a frequently used uh, method, and and I don't know if either of you can think of another case where it was used. I cannot. No. Okay. I think this is worth looking at, uh, as Bruce said, for us as a council. Uh, and get clarity on this. Uh, but I don't think this item tonight uh, is the time to to make that make that change. But I do think we'd like uh, I would like to see um, I'd like to see a better way of dealing with this. And, and and I do understand the point that Steve is making and that Bruce is making. Um, I just don't think that this project and this this item tonight is the time for us to to address it. I, th I think I am I am okay with uh, going with the staff recommendation, but I do think we need we need to to get a a better handle on this. And and maybe right now tonight this is publicizing that this is this is an acceptable method and that's probably not what we want to do. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? So in, in order to avoid publicizing that this is acceptable, can't we just give the applicant the opportunity to withdraw their appeal and go back to the planning commission rather than us do it for them? Bruce, if, if, we, if we refuse the remand, then their only option is to come forward to us 
with the project, as I understand it. Is that correct, Richard? That is correct, yes. They can withdraw their appeal. Well, that's correct. I'm sorry. They can, yes, they can withdraw the appeal. Um, my guess is they would probably just continue forward, pay the revised plans fee and, and bring you the, the item on appeal. Are, are they stuck with the one-year prohibition if they withdraw their appeal? Uh, no, they are not. So uh, I don't believe it was denied with prejudice. With, with I'm sorry, with or without? I, I don't believe it was denied with oh. prejudice. Okay, double negative there. You confuse me. Uh, well then, well then, why do they need us to do anything? Why don't they just? That was my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that even shouldn't be allowed. But let, let's, you know, why why should we be wasting our time, and why should we be granting these kinds of things when the the the, the party is the master of their own domain here? They can get exactly what they're asking us to do. This seems like a total waste of the public's time and our time. And I, I agree with Bruce a bit on that because I mean this in all my years on planning and city council now, this is the first time we've had two planning commissioners actually on city council. Most city councils I've seen didn't have anybody. So how are they going to even begin to deal with this? Um, so I, I think it is a bit of an odd one. And it is worth considering if this is the right way for it to come forward in the future. But we do have a motion in a second at, at this point, but I think it's a worthy discussion going forward. Kelsey, could you take the roll? Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? No. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Motion carries. Thank you. It is currently 907 or something like that. And we have a eight minute uh, recess to, which I guess puts us at about uh, 9.15. Is that acceptable? Thank Sounds you. Great. Thank you.
Hey, Paul. Hey, hey Bruce. Hey, Steve. Hello, Steve McCall McClary, John Cotty. Hello. Welcome back, Karen and Mikey. I think we have a quorum. So I'd like to call the meeting back to order. As long as the time clock agrees. We're currently at item 5A, old business, consideration of the resumption of in-person meetings. Do we have a staff report? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, my report is fairly brief tonight. Um, as you heard during my report earlier this evening, uh, there has been an increase in the uh, rate of uh, reported cases um, uh, with COVID. And, um, and as a result, uh, uh, we are continuing to proceed, um, I would say with a high level of caution and uh, and being very conservative here, at least in terms of um, how we're operating at City Hall. Uh, we are continuing to work under the uh, requirement that all persons, regardless of vaccination status, uh, must uh, wear a mask when they are in City Hall. Um, and, uh, and again, that is also uh, following along with the recommendation that uh, is currently being made from the LA County Department of Public Health. Um, so we are uh, confident that that is the right decision at this point uh, to continue um, with that mask requirement for City Hall. Uh, and additionally with that, um, we still have the uh, governor's order, which gives the option of doing the remote meetings as we're doing right now, uh, that is still permissible through September 30th. Uh, I've not heard whether that date will be extended uh, at this point. Uh, there's a chance that it could end on that date, a chance that it could be extended, but we haven't heard any, any indications one way or the other. Uh, as I stated before, uh, I think trying to do in-person meetings uh, with everybody in the room and wearing masks uh, would be uh, challenging, if, if not uh, if not near impossibility. Uh, my recommendation would be that we continue uh, under the current meeting format uh, and uh, keep this on the agenda uh, as an item. And we would re ask that, I, that we could then revisit this at our next regular meeting. And again, just to remind council, we are scheduled to go dark uh, two weeks from now. And the next regular meeting would be is scheduled uh, for Monday, August 9th. So that's be my recommendation that we uh, take no action at this point, other than to direct that this continue to be on the agenda and uh, come back with uh, a recommendation and report on August 9th. Thank you, Steve. Do we have any public comments signed up for this item, Kelsey? We don't have any public speakers for this item. Okay. So it goes to the council. Would anyone like to speak on this? I make a motion to uh, receive and file the update and move forward. Is there a second? I see a second from Steve Uring. I'll second. Okay, would you like to call the roll, Kelsey? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 6A, homelessness, homelessness task force which is an item that was continued from June 14th, 2021. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council. Yes, um, as Mayor said, this is an item that was continued from the 14th um, in order to provide the council members a little more time to review background information. Uh, as you know, the city currently has a homelessness working group that was created to oversee the implementation of the current homelessness strategic plan that was adopted in 2018. 
the primary objective of that plan was to provide services and a path to housing, as well as protecting the safety of the community. Uh, but over the last few years, the Homelessness Working Group has evolved, spending a lot of time researching and exploring different strategies to address homelessness and the many safety concerns surrounding the issue of homelessness. Uh, late in 2020, it became obvious that the existing goals and objectives of the plan needed to be updated to better reflect current conditions, primarily with respect to safety. Um, and this has really become the focus point lately, especially with some of the recent fires that have occurred. Uh, the group finished drafting an update in February, but the update draft hasn't been presented to the community yet or the council. Um, so, and that is attached to this report for your review as well. Um, it was suggested at a previous meeting that if a task force is formed, that it be comprised of 10 people with each council member appointing two individuals. Uh, staff recommends that the council also consider the existing homelessness working group and the work that's been done to date and provide direction on the possible formation of a task force. Uh, and this should include its composition, the purpose, and any other details that'll be important to its formation and implementation. This uh, concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Susan. Who'd like to start? Pablo? Do we have any public speakers? <laughs> Thank we you, Mikey. We do Thank not have you, any speakers for this item. Everybody's on vacation, guys. Go mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, it's not <laughs> even midnight. <laughs> well, you have a big yellow sticker that says, ask for the public. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm glad to go first, if, unless someone else wants to. Okay. In my opinion, we are failing. As a city council at this time, we are failing to take enough proper actions to deal with our homelessness issues, which has resulted in increased and unacceptable public safety concerns throughout Malibu. While obviously we are of varying opinions on what we should do, the vast majority can agree that we are not doing enough. For the last two years, our sheriffs have directly told us that we need to do more so that they can enforce our already existing laws. I believe that we've had 10 fires this year that have started due to people camping in the brush. So far, we've been lucky, but uh, that we haven't had an absolute disaster or loss of life, but luck is a poor strategy for moving forward. I think the goals for this task force should be to come up with recommendations that guide us effectively in responding to public safety and community concerns related to homelessness and in reducing homelessness in Malibu. Um, that also enable the sheriff's department to enforce our no camping and no parking laws. And thus we reduce public safety issues and concerns, including fire danger, crime, trash, sanitation issues, all of it, while directly having an impact on the amount of unhoused people in Malibu. And we need to reduce the city's legal exposure that has been experienced by other cities that have unhoused populations. The task force needs overarching goals with deadlines to bring forward recommendations to the city council so, so that we can do our jobs and make decisions related to the goals I just mentioned. In short, I recommend a 10 member task force as has been discussed with two members picked by each city council member as has been discussed with one member elected as chair of the committee that works directly with our public safety liaison and that we should promote that this task force forms ad hoc committees with the goal of reaching out to outside agencies and experts with the further goal of giving us expedited but educated recommendations on what actions we need to take immediately. I feel we are at a crisis point. And I think we know that we need to provide services we're not providing now in order to have the help we need from the county and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I suspect the biggest issue we are struggling with right now is how and where those services are provided that allow us to regain the ability to enforce our laws and provide a safer environment for our housed and unhoused residents and visitors. I don't care where and how we provide the services we seem to be required to provide, but I do know that what we're doing now is failing and it is not enough. 
Those are my comments for now, uh, so everyone else can share their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. I don't, Bruce, I see your hand. And thank you, by the way, for using the electronic hand. It's much easier to see. And I see Karen's. I've been, I've been trying. Karen, if you want to go ahead first, um, I'll wait. No, I'd like to hear what you have to say, Bruce. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, first of all, I, I support wholeheartedly the creation of the task force with two representatives appointed by each member of council. I hope that one's going to be a, a non-issue. Um, as far as providing the um, direction to that task force, assuming it's developed, um, I think that they ought to be developing a proposed revised homelessness strategic plan. Um, we've been offered one by the homelessness working group. Um, but I think that that ought to be the, the role of this in the first instance, very first thing to do is for this task force to look at that and make their own decision as to what to recommend. Um, I've reviewed the draft by the um, homelessness working group, and I think it varies substantially from the direction that the council provided three years ago in the strategic uh, plan that was adopted by the council. As um, Susan said, they've evolved. I think they've evolved a little further than they were directed to evolve. So I think it's good to have this task force created, have representatives who are there by council persons, and have them take a look. They can, you know, they can look at this draft report. They can look at our original report. They can consider whatever else they want, and they can get input, obviously, from the strategic working group, that, I mean, the um, homelessness working group. They obviously are residents. They're, they're members of the public. They can participate in Brown Act meetings just like anyone else can. They can have a spokesperson if they want, but um, they shouldn't necessarily get deference in my view, but that'll be up obviously to this task force. Um, Mikey made a point about helping the sheriff enforce the no camping laws. I've been told now repeatedly point blank by the captain and, and, and the lieutenant who is our um, liaison that we just need to provide them with vouchers or beds outside of Malibu and they will do their job of enforcing our no camping law. Now, maybe they won't, but that's what they said they will do. They've said it now to me repeatedly, get them vouchers so that they can offer a place to take people and they will enforce that law. They don't expect that most of the people who are living on our public property are gonna take them up on it but that will be the option of the person who's given that option. If they don't take them up on it, they can leave or they can go spend the night in Lost Hills. Um, the, I, the, I've seen a draft report by the homelessness working group that addresses the putative need for an ASL and possible locations. I, I think there are fundamental flaws in that. And again, though, that'll be up to the, um, the task force to decide for themselves. I would hope that they would actually consider first the question of whether we need to have that before they would consider the question of where it should be because I think when the question is answered in the abstract, there are different answers by different people throughout the city. Um, the point about a chair that works with the staff, you know, as everyone knows, we are not of like mind in what needs to be done. And I suspect the members of this task force are not gonna be of like mind as to what needs to be done. Um, it, it may be that if, if, and maybe they will be, but it may be that if they turn out to be seriously divided, it would make more sense to have two people that work with the staff. Um, but again, I, I would be up, to, I, I would say leave that up to them to decide. So um, I think I'm rambling at this point. I, I support the creation of the task force. I don't think we're going to be appointing the people tonight. We would do that perhaps at the next meeting. Um, or maybe that's something someone can answer. Maybe that's something we can do not at a meeting. I don't know. Um, but I support the creation of the task force as it's explained. And I think that our only direction to them should be get working, get us something. Because um, I agree with Mikey, we're failing. We need to get something done. We just have a diverse opinion on what that should be. Thank you, Bruce. Karen, and then Steve. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
Mikey, I want to thank you for your uh, succinct comments. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Uh, and I thought you articulated that very well. It didn't bark until I turned my, uh, my mic on. Um, we've got these issues. We've got obviously public safety, environmental degradation. Um, our city has become less welcoming to residents and visitors, but we're seeing this all over the place um, and things are changing. Uh, we had success with uh, the parking restrictions we were able to enact on the highway. Uh, I and others wish that we had been able to restrict them more, um, but we got what we got uh, and it's helping. But things are changing. Venice is being cleared out. And I think one thing that's predictable is that we can expect some of those people will make their way up here. Um, Bruce, the voucher uh, system that you brought up, I don't have specifics and uh, John or Susan, maybe one of you could help us with this. My yeah, impression I can comment is, on that when you want me to. Okay, my impression is that Beverly Hills is doing this um, and has something like a joint use agreement. I believe with Los Angeles, it might be with Culver City, uh, where they are basically paying another city to take their homeless. I think that's an option open to us as well, but I think the logistics are going to make it really difficult. We are, you know, 20 square miles. Uh, we're isolated. Uh, to the north of us, we have Ventura County. Uh, look, look at the borders. We've got the Santa Monica Mountains, the ocean, and a different county. I think we're going to have really difficult logistical problems trying to make something like that work. If there's a way to make it work, I'd love to hear about it um, from, from Susan or, or anybody else who's, who's got uh, ideas there. Um, what we saw, I know we, you've heard again and again, uh, those of us who went to Laguna Beach and saw their ASL, it's working. Uh, and Laguna is similar to Malibu. It's bigger, uh, but they have a similar topography. They have a you know similar, a similar city, it's just bigger. The other big difference is they have their own police department. But what we were told is that what they have allows their police department to enforce the law. They've gotten people off Main Beach, they've gotten people off private property, uh, and they have a choice of using this uh, ASL or, or leaving. Um, in fact, I, I told Steve McCleary today, I'd, I either give him my packet or, or get another copy of the packet that we were given in Laguna. It's excellent. Uh, and they have a, they have a good operator. I believe it's Mercy House, Susan, but it, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, there are operators. Um, I think I agree with what, what we've already said. We need to set up this task force and we need regular progress reports updates, whether they're quarterly or whatever they are. Yeah, we need to get moving on this. Um, we're not going to wish it away. Uh, we don't want to have a solution imposed upon us. Uh, that's the last thing I want. And I think nobody here wants to lose local control like that. Um, so the, the sooner we can move on this, I think the better off we are. Bruce, I understand your concern that we don't all see see this the same way. Uh, maybe we could have something like a, a, a rotating chair. I, I think I think two co-chairs are difficult. Maybe maybe the chair rotates quarterly, half yearly, or something like that. Um, no surprise, the biggest issue with the ASL or safe parking program or anything like that 
is the location. And I will say, and, and I've had this discussion with somebody that, uh, who's put probably more time and heart and soul into this than anybody else, and that's Paul Elder. And he said to me, I, I, I have a concern for these people. I, I feel a moral obligation. I also don't want them near where I live. And he doesn't live in Malibu. So I recognize that. Um, and I think the best thing we could do, in my opinion, is set something up that's temporary. Set something up with modular structures, uh, as simple as possible. I welcome anybody to look at what Laguna Beach has done and, and to, to look at a temporary uh, facility and maybe revisit it after a year or something like that and, and see if it's working, see if the location uh, is causing more problems, fewer problems, whatever than, than we would have expected. But I, I have to agree with Mikey, we've got to do something. So those are my comments. Thank you, Karen. Steve, you are next. I also see John Cotty fidgeting. I was just going to direct the council back to the item at hand, which is the establishment of the task force and any requirements that you want to impose on the task force. The ASL really isn't before the council tonight. I get that it's tangentially related, but the issue before the council again is the task force. Gotcha. Thank you so much, John. And, and Steve. John, that's, good. that's where I was headed, John. I mean, this issue that says we want to get started, why don't we appoint the people tonight? All right. Good idea. Get them going, all right? Uh, I think we can give them some, you know. I look at this, you know, we've got an immediate concern. we got homeless people living up in the hills starting fires. So it seems to me that if I were going to the task force, I said the very first thing I want you guys to do is come up with a plan to figure out how we deal with that, okay? Uh, and we need that one ASAP. Then the second thing, second item I would direct them, and I think we've had a whole bunch of, of planning and stuff done about how you would build an ASL here in Malibu. All right? I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that's in there, but there's been a lot of thinking and stuff and they, they put in that. Uh, so I think the second thing I would like this task force to do is, is put some effort into seeing if there is a remote location we can use to deal with our homeless situation. Uh, and the, the folks that I have talked to do not believe that Malibu has the infrastructure to, act, to adequately deal with the homeless population. We don't have hospitals, we don't have mental health, we don't have all that stuff. So I would, you know, I would recommend that the sec one of the second tasks this group has is look at that. And then the third thing regarding the chairs, let them figure out what kind of chairs they want. They're smart people, let them sit down figure out how they, what's the most effective way for them to run their, their organization and let them do it. That's what we're asking them to do. There's only 10 of them. They should be able to talk and figure it out. I'm done, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Bruce, I see your hand. Thanks again, Paul. So um, th three quick comments. And um, John, I appreciate that we're not deciding substance tonight. I'm gonna just stay very uh, high level. This, the description was was made by someone, I think it might have been Karen, that, you know, we need to figure out something to do with our, I'm sorry, it, 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 other cities have taken their homeless and maybe found a place outside the city, but that may not work for our homeless. I, I think we need a different paradigm because we don't have homeless. We have people who have come to Malibu that are homeless and taken up camping residents on our public property and in some people trespassing on their private property. We don't have, maybe we've got one, two or three, and I don't think so, people who lost their home, who are Malibu residents who are now living on the street here. But these are not our homeless. I'm sorry to say that they are people who are visitors who decided not to leave. Um, second, the issue of a temporary facility, I just want to make the point that you know, this is some of my legal training can come in to bear to think about this. You worry, 
anyone that's worried about losing local control, no one's going to come in here and force us to do anything until we're ready to do something. That's that's not on the horizon. But I'll tell you, the minute you put up a temporary structure, when you go to remove it, if it's not working, you're going to get we're going to get an injunction application because then we're trying to change the status quo and a court will have no problem considering whether to stop us from changing the status quo as opposed to trying to make us do something different in the first instance. So just, we need to be leery of that. It's, it sounds great, let's just do it and see if it works. But if it doesn't work, we may not be able to get rid of it. Um, the last thing is Steve on appointing people. I, mean, the, I don't know that we can, John can even talk to that. I, I, I didn't presume we were gonna do this tonight. So I certainly haven't already cleared with two people who would be my appointees, but the agenda doesn't say that we're going to appoint anybody. I don't, I don't know that as a matter of protocol, we can, because that's not what the public was told we're doing tonight. A structure is not the same thing as specifically identifying who the people are gonna be. So I don't know if we can appoint people, but I'm, I'm not ready to do that. I, I didn't presume that we would come together and make that decision. And I don't wanna publicly identify people that could do this that haven't agreed to do it. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. Paul, Paul one last question before we do that. Well, I can make a motion and you could have it in discussion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we establish a homeless task force consisting of 10 people. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. You and seconded it, so you get the first discussion, Steve. Okay. Thank I mean, you. is there some way we're not going to meet again until August? And I mean, right. okay. And, you know, we had a presentation tonight by the fire captain there that, you know, we almost burnt down tuna candy. Is there any way we can get together between now and August to appoint the people? Or is there another way we can appoint them where we don't have to get together? But I sure like to get the process cooking. Thank you, Steve. I think that's a question for John. And you can come together with a special meeting. You call that on 24, 24 hours notice and um, appoint people to the committee, certainly. Okay. Okay. Bruce? And then John, Steve McClary. John Cotty, are, are we able tonight to resolve to have it consist of people that we send a letter in identifying or something like that? Or do we have to have a meeting where we all do this publicly together? Councilmember Silverstein, and in effect, all of you, what I would suggest is that we have that special meeting and you direct staff to bring back a resolution establishing the committee, establishing its parameters, establishing the number of commissioners and the protocols. And then at that meeting, you direct staff to appoint, or you would appoint your members to the commission at that point in time after adoption of that resolution. Um, you know, tonight it's certainly not on the agenda, as you noted. Um, I think the better practice would be to bring back that resolution, establishing the committee and its format, and at that meeting, um, appoint your members. You can certainly do that next week or, or as soon as you guys can get in touch with your proposed um, committee members, and as soon as staff can get that resolution, which I'm happy to help draft. Thanks, John. Steve is waited with his hand up. Steve McClary. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I was going to make comments very much similar to what uh, the city attorney just made. Uh, and also, I just wanted to throw out one thing for Council to think about. Um, if you think about most appointed bodies generally have an odd number. Uh, councils are typically five or seven. Planning commissions are five or seven. Uh, and, and the simple reason for that is that you don't end up in a situation, for example, where you go to elect your chair and you have a deadlock 5-5 five, five split. So I suppose it's, you know, I may be overthinking this and I'm, I'm sure most bodies could probably find a way to work around it. But uh, as a matter of habit or practice, that's typically why you see an odd number and for your number uh, for, for commissions and, and task force and things like that. So just wanted to throw that out there for council's consideration. Uh, but again, I think you're, you can certainly do the even number if that's the direction you'd like to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaren. Mikey? I just, I, if I understood the motion, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment that I think was meant to be included in it. And that I think the motion was to form a 10 member task force and I would just add that 
two members pick each, picked by each city council member. I, I accept that friendly amendment, which of course I actually thought of, but failed to verbalize. Let's call roll call. Let's let's get this thing moving. I think Steve needs to accept the change first. Oh, Steve, right. are you there? I'll accept it. No problem. Okay. Kelsey, would you like to call the roll for us? Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Uh, can John or or maybe Kelsey can give us a little guidance. Uh, if we notice the uh, a meeting, a special meeting to appoint the people, we need to give them a minimum of seven days notice. Is that correct? The public? What we'll are the noticing requirements? We'll need to post agenda 24 hours in advance of the meeting. Uh, we will need a little time to prepare the resolution and staff report, but that would be a better question for John or Susan. Okay. And that's a correct, correct it. And the amount, uh, Susan, how much time do you think you would need to prepare the uh, staff report? The staff report. I can have that done tomorrow. Why, right. why so long? Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably have it finished in an hour. <laughs> is it, is it, uh, would it, Steve, would it be appropriate for us to have a short discussion of the or the earliest possible time that we could be ready to come back, or is that something that? Uh... Um, yeah, I, I I think that's I think we could certainly have that discussion tonight. So it sounds like Susan's ready to go. Uh, so I think it's really just a matter of um, I think trying to find a date, maybe in the next week or so, that would work with everybody. Yeah, I don't want to interfere with anybody's vacation plans, but I'm a, I'm going to be around. We can certainly pull counsel as to their availability. Uh, I don't think it would be too lengthy of a meeting, and and you know, so we could we can pull counsel and see if we can find a date here coming up shortly. Should we ask uh, staff what a meeting, what what date there isn't a meeting scheduled for that night? Or is this something we could, I, I think we want to do it in front of the public and invite their, their thoughts. So Usually we're going to have to- Thursday nights are good. I don't, Kelsey may know offhand. I I'm know. checking our calendar and we don't have any other virtual meetings scheduled this week. I'm, I'm not sure everyone else's staff commitments, but our meeting schedule is open. Well. I have one question. I don't know if I'm guessing I can ask this. Um, because the staff report seems pretty, you know, basic. Uh, I guess the one question I would want is, I'm assuming that this group, you would have them meet monthly at a minimum. Is that a good assumption? Or more often as needed, or as needed, but at least at a minimum monthly, you know, what were you, what are you guys thinking? What I was thinking with the, the group of 10 is that when they meet, that is a Brown Act group. And if, it, if, if five of them meet, it's, it's still a Brown Act group. But if, if four of them, if they wanna divide into groups of four and the person could be a member of more than one of those groups of four, they could, they could meet and they could meet as an ad hoc group and then bring their results back to the monthly meeting or the bi-monthly meeting and and report it to the whole group when it's a publicly noticed meeting. And I'm hoping that that is something that's legally plausible and uh, might help them uh, go several ways and then bring information back for the group as a whole. I see Bruce's hand. Just clarification question. Is five, a Brown, is five a, the Brown Act limit if you've got 10 or is six the limit? I, I think it's... Less than a quorum, so it would be four. Well, five, five would not be a majority. Actually, party. six would be the quorum, so it would be five. Yeah, so you could have five. That would be interesting. It would be. That's, I like Paul's idea. 
But you could do it with five. You could do it with five. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad we're ready to move forward. The only I, I heard sort of this thing for Thursday night. It's my wife's birthday. There's just zero chance I can pull that off. Sorry. As much as I want to move this forward, if you're listening, honey. I got your back. Um, I think as I think as Mr. McClary mentioned, I think we can pull the council and yeah. get a good date in the next, you know, either later this week or really next week. Yeah. Cool. That works with the council. We do earlier on Thursday. Works for me. <laughs> Could we have an earlier um, meeting on Thursday? Legally. Well, Paul, we have a three o'clock meeting. That's true. We have a three o'clock meeting on Thursday, which is probably going to take us at least an hour and maybe longer. We can pull everybody outside of the meeting and, and sort this out All and right. find the, the find the, the, the soonest available date. All right. All right. So I'm going to thank everybody for that. And next, we're going to go to item 6B, if we can. Item 6B was put on the agenda because there is a plan that was first brought forward in 2020 uh, for the various uh, beach accesses that MRCA is planning on opening in Malibu or improving further from their current status. And the idea was we wanted this came to our attention when the uh, La Costa Beach uh, opening happened suddenly and without notice. The Carbon La Costa Beach, the D, it's D4 on page five of the uh, document here. And so the thought is that we should discuss this and get a, get a feel for this and see what other things are doing. And I'm gonna yield to the staff who I see waiting patiently. Thank you, Renita. You're welcome. And good evening, Mayor Grisanti and member, honor, honorable members of the City Council. MRCA and the State Coastal Conservancy both serve as co-lead agencies for the proposed Malibu Coastal Access Public Works Plan, or PWP for short, which is a comprehensive plan to construct and maintain 17 public beach um, access ways located on publicly owned sites along the coast in Malibu. The PWP will include site analyses, development criteria, and a, man and a set of management policies for the access ways. May I have the next slide, please? This is a map that shows the locations of the 17 access ways along the stretch of coast between Topanga Canyon Road and Lachusa Beach. Seven of these access ways consist of new development on unapproved sites, and the remaining 10 access ways are either existing access ways or those that are already approved with pending construction. On this map, the purple markers represent the unapproved sites with pendi and pending new access ways. The red markers indicate the existing access ways, and the one blue marker indicates the currently unapproved site, but is approved for construction. The city is processing two coastal permits for two of these access ways. One um, site located at M3, which is a new site, a new access way um, on, unapproved, on an unapproved site located at Las, Las Flores Beach and site M10, which is an existing access way at Lachusa Beach with pending um, improvements. May I have the next slide, please? The next, floor, the next four slides are um, a closer view of the proposed locations. Um, this first slide is a stretch of coast that shows the access ways proposed between Topanga Canyon Road to the east and Las Flores Canyon Road to the west. Next slide, please. And this slide shows um, the access ways located between Las Flores Canyon Road to the east and Bluffs Park on the west. 
Next slide, please. And heading a further, a little further west, um, this slide shows the access ways proposed between Bluffs Park to the east and Escondido, Escondido Beach to the west. Next slide. And this last slide shows uh, the two uh, the two access ways proposed between Escondido Beach and Lachusa Beach. Next slide, please. The Public Resources Code, which includes the Coastal Act, identifies a PWP as a comprehensive permitting tool to improve the efficiency of the planning and implementation of public works projects. Rather than obtaining multiple coastal permits from the local jurisdiction for multiple sites and or multiple phases of a project, a comprehensive PWP can be submitted directly to the Coastal Commission for review and approval. The Public Resources Code also authorizes the State Coastal Conservancy with the responsibility to establish a system of public access ways along the coast in California. The California Code of Regulations includes the authority and rules for the Coastal Commission to carry out the provisions of the Coastal Act and establishes the procedures for the Coastal Commission to review and consider a PWP. And this is the same process as a local coastal program amendment. The California Code of Regulations also requires the California Coastal Commission to engage in consultation with the affected local jurisdictions um, during its consideration of the PWP. The Malibu Municipal Code provides a definition of a major public works facility, which includes publicly financed recreational facilities that either increase or decrease public recreational facility access to public, re public recreational facilities. And this is the justification for the public beach access ways to be processed as a PWP. May I have the next slide, please? This is a, a flow chart that shows the uh, review of the PWP under CEQA, and it also shows uh, the process for the PWP. The California Coastal Conservancy authorized the PWP in 20, um, 2012, and then again in 2017. And after completing a draft initial study, released a notice of preparation of the EIR in December of 2019. The city provided comments and raised several concerns during the 60 day scoping period for the initial study. And this is included as attachment two of your staff report. The scoping period concluded in February, 2020 and the draft EIR is currently being prepared. And that's what the, yellow, the red um, highlight on this flow chart, that's the current status of um, the review under CEQA. Uh, the Coastal Conservancy expects the EIR to be completed by summer 2022, after which time the public review and comment period will occur before the co-lead agencies hold a public hearing to take action on the final EIR and the PWP. Although the city prefers to maintain permit authority over the access ways proposed in the PWP, Staff is monitoring opportunities for public participation, which will include the opportunity to uh, provide review and comment during the draft EIR, which again is expected around um, summer 2022. Um, there's also an opportunity to provide public comment during the public hearings held by the co-lead agencies when they consider the final EIR and the PWP for um, approval. And uh, there's also an opportunity to provide public comment when the Coastal Commission, during the Coastal Commission hearing, um, when they consider, what it considers the PWP. Although representatives from either of the code lead agencies were unable to attend tonight's city council meeting, staff did receive a letter from MRCA, uh, which I believe may have been distributed to the council um, before tonight's meeting. 
um, and MRCA provided a couple of comments on the staff report for tonight's item. Um, the first comment was regarding the public participation and that um, MRCA believes that the PWP provides a broader opportunity for public participation um, rather than uh, compared to the process for individual coastal permits. MRCA also reiterated the public resources code section in the Coastal Act that defines a public works um, project as a publicly financed recreational facility. facility. Um, this definition also includes all projects um, proposed by the State Coastal Conservancy. The letter from MRCA also addressed some issues that were actually raised um, in the city's comment letter during the scoping of the draft initial study. Um, the first comment being that um, there was a comment regarding, um, oh, it was justifying how MRCA and the California Coastal Conservancy were determined to be co-lead agencies on this project. Um, the other comment um, was essentially um, the disagreement regarding the city commenting on um, the objection to the use of a PWP. Um, and it, which I believe the city's comment letter is attached to your staff report. Um, the city um, objected to for the use of the PWP um, for these individual access ways. And MRCA believes that that comment um, was not to be included in our comment letter because it really should have been addressing the draft initial study. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you, Renika. Hey, I'm not seeing a, a storm of hands being raised. Public. Public comments? Public, public comments? Public comments. Do we have any members of the public? We do not have any speakers for this item. I can see the headlines tomorrow. Rusani disregards public comment. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm dead. Uh, Bruce. You wrote the headline already. Uh, so I, I, two comments. One is, I, I that, oh, actually three. First of all, Renika, thank you. That was that was very helpful um, and, and concise explanation. I question, what is the purpose, though, of, of having these um, receive and file items? I mean, we, we can all read. Um, I don't understand why in a long night we, we take time to get these kinds of presentations when all we're doing is getting a piece of paper and putting it in a file. I mean, and you know, sometimes we move to receive it, other times we just receive it, but it's, I don't get why we're doing that. Um, it, it's, an easy, it's easy enough for the city manager or city staff to send us this material and have us read it uh, or put it on the website. Um, the other comment I'll make though, while, since we're talking about the, the subject matter, you know, I think we're tilting at windmills to the extent that there's an air of, we don't like that it's being done this way. I mean, apparently the MRCA has the legal right to do it this way. And to the extent we've got problems of what it is they're proposing to do, you know, we have to work on it through the Coastal Commission. That's just, that's the process that the state law provides. Um, Cause I, I, I've sensed either either I re read it explicitly or there's an implicit undertone that we think that they should let us make the decisions in the first place, which I get why they don't want us to do that. I get why we want to do it, but we don't have that ability. So why are we dealing with that? All right, those are my comments. Mikey wants to speak and, and uh, I'm sure that, go ahead, Mikey, please. Um, not quite along the lines of Bruce, but kind of. Um, as a receive and file, I see that the city has already submitted a letter with a position. So, and with the letter from that we got right before the meeting, 10 minutes before the meeting, I think, um, from MRCA, is this a chance to clarify our comments or is it still just a receive and file because that's how it was brought forward to us? Um, I mean, are we looking to to clarify our remarks, add new remarks, or uh, I guess a, a little bit along the line of Bruce's, you know, okay. well, is, there an, is there an additional point to this meeting that we can do something a little more proactive? 
I am, uh, I am the person who, uh, when I saw the initial report, I wasn't on the council in February of 2020 when they, when they wrote this. And somehow this whole, uh, whatever caused the, the uh, city to write a letter to Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, I was not aware that it was happening at that time. And I thought, I flatter myself by thinking I'm pretty obsessed about stuff like this. And I didn't know about it. A lot of members of the public didn't know about it. When the, when the walkway was, when the fence was taken down between La Costa and Carbon, uh, very few of the people on that street uh, in that area there knew anything about uh, that, that uh, proposed thing, which I think is D3 on these maps. And so uh, as far as people being able to read about it, I, I certainly would have read about it if I had known that it was out there to read uh, until the, the fence was taken down, uh, its existence escaped my notice. Uh, and I think that our legal position is probably that we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, yielded and said, yes, we agree with your argument. And so this is an informational thing. This is something that it will come up. And I think most of the people who own a home near or on one of the beaches that's near there are going to want there to be a special meeting about each one of these as it comes up so that they have a chance to hear that there's going to be an adequate fence, that there is going to be an adequate gate, that it's going to be properly signed, that there's going to be restrooms, that the gate is going to be closed at night and not open before dawn, uh, and that there will be garbage pickup which is a, a complaint I got the other day about one on in the 25,000 block of uh, Malibu Road. There doesn't seem to be any garbage pickup. So these are, these are the kind of things that I think that are the concerns of the people who live along the beach or people who show up to use one of these things and find the beach in that particular location unmaintained, so. And yet we have six members of the public here. And so I hope the press will, will pick up on this issue um, because uh, it's not getting a lot of people out tonight, that's for sure. Well, I, I guess my timing was poor. Steve? You're yeah, I, I, I wanna just go back and, and touch base on Bruce's comment. Uh, I, I think he's right. I mean, we, we have not found ourselves on the right side of any discussion with the Coastal Commission in a very long time. Uh, and, and Paul, you're exactly right. I mean, you know, the big complaints uh, regarding, you know, the, the access ways are parking, all right? You know, do they, do they have adequate parking? Is there a trash can there that somebody picks up trash with? You know, everybody would like to see a, a bathroom of some type located there. Uh, and then whether it's open, the hours when it's open or closed. And, you know, if, if the, MRCA and the other organization continue down the path they're going, we're going to have a tough time getting those in. So I'm just wondering, is there any value in us starting to lobby the coastal commissioners? I mean, to pick out a couple of them and try and get some people on our side before this stuff comes before us, because if, if, if we do it at the last minute, we're going to get the same response you got at the last meeting we went to when they just told us to take a hike. Uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out some way to, to, at least open a discussion that we have a chance to say something and maybe get something done because if we're going to fight the MRCA, we're going to lose. What I think. That's all I got. Thank you, Steve. I see Mikey's hand is still raised. Um, just a couple of comments on what Steve said. Um, number one, we actually, our relationship with Coastal is as good as it's been, I think. I think it's actually pretty good. And and that's evidenced by the the poison pesticide ban that they really were heartfelt about figuring out with Richard and with Poison Free Malibu. So I think I think there's some real highlights in our relationship right now. And I'm really appreciative of that. And there was we even managed to joke around a little bit on a couple of those meetings that 
you know, we agree except where we don't. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all bad. So I took that as a positive sign. And the vast majority of coastal commissioners do not take ex parte meetings. And uh, just a little FYI, it's just uh, maybe our lobbyists can help us with that. But just thought I'd toss that out too. Thank you. I see Bruce's hand is up. Yeah, um, in response to the last point, actually, that Mikey just made, I, I could be wrong, but I, th I think they don't take ex partes on appeals, but not necessarily on le on legislative issues, which this might be more. I, anyway, I know that there's some distinction. Um, you know, the way I see it is, I mean, first of all, this did happen, this is already a year ago, a year and a half ago. The way the city goes about these kinds of matters, especially with the MRCA, is just to fight tooth and nail everything. So, I mean, you know, and I, I'm sure people are surprised to hear me saying this kind of thing because, like, you know, my history is find every argument you can. But when you've got someone who's got leverage over you, like they do, I mean, they're, they're in with the Coastal Commission. They're a big player. They got not unlimited resources, but far more than we do. To send a 15 point complaint about what they're doing with the argument being they should have to come to us for permission rather than do what they have the legal right to do, isn't the way to get them to do some of the things we want them to do, which are the most important ones, like the things that, that Paul was talking about. So, I mean, you know, I, I think we need to pick our battles with them and hopefully not make them battles so much as find a way that we have a common goal and identify issues that would make it work better for both of us. So, I mean, I, I'm hoping we're gonna start seeing a little, little more of that going forward rather than treating them like they're a litigation adversary every time they propose to do something or do something which they have the legal right to do. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Karen is waiting to speak. Karen? Yeah, sorry for the delay. The MRCA has the right to do things, obviously. We've seen that again and again. But I think they also have an obligation to be a responsible steward, to promote safety. Uh, whoever said it, Mikey or Steve, parking, trash pickup, uh, the gates being monitored, opened and closed, hours posted. Uh, you know, I hate to think oh. that, whoa. Sorry. I hate to think that we're going to just throw in the towel that the MRCA can do whatever they want and and we just have to bite the bullet. I really think we, you know, this letter, I, I'm very uh, on board with every point that was made in the letter sent to the MRCA. And I think we have to stay on that track. I, I think we have a responsibility to constituents, to uh, visitors. We have a responsibility to, to have the beaches safely accessible and maintained. Uh, environmental issues with the water. I mean, we just, I, I'm not ready to throw in the towel and just accept whatever the MRCA feels like doing for us. So, uh, I, you know, I, re I realize this item is uh, receive and file, but I think we need to stay aware that we have to advocate for ourselves. It's, we're not going to, you know, th things haven't gone well already, and, and I think we have to brace ourselves to, to keep advocating. So that's all I have to say. Erin, thank you. I'd like to just say that the... Uh... The position of the MRCA is not settled law. And Bruce, if you want to speak, you, you may, and then we can file this and move on. I was to say, I hope nothing I said was um, taken to mean I think we should throw in the towel. I, I think we just need to be more um, selective about the punches that we throw and maybe even not throw them as punches so much as extend our hand. But I'll make a motion that we receive and file this. Okay, I've got a motion to receive and file. Second. I'll second. Oh, we have four other people fighting for the second, but I, I think it was, I think it was Mikey. Okay, Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Yes. 
Councilmember Fair? I'm yes. sorry, Councilmember Pearson. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Councilmember <laughs> Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. It takes us to item 6C, Malibu Arts Association event fee waiver. We have a staff report for that. Yes, good evening, Mayor Grisanti and members of City Council. The item before you this evening is a request from the Malibu Arts Association to host an art show event at Legacy Park on Sunday, August 8th. Uh, the event will showcase 30 local artists, which uh, the public will be able to purchase their artwork, and that artwork will support those artists, as well as the Malibu Arts Association. Uh, there is no fee for the artists to participate in the event, and 15% of all the sales will actually go back to the Malibu Arts Association to be utilized for scholarships and books for local students. Uh, the total amount of the fee waiver request is $1,278, and that includes facility use fees, staffing fees, and our temporary use permit fee, which they have already paid, but we would uh, give that back to them if approved by the City Council tonight. Uh, per our municipal code, we allow up to six temporary use permits on a parcel each calendar year, and this would be the first one that we would use for Legacy Park. I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have, and also I believe Barbara Freund is still here from the Malibu Arts Association, and she can answer any additional questions as well uh, regarding the association or the event. Thank you, Jesse. Perhaps you would like to lead off in the public comment, since we actually have someone to publicly comment. She is our only public speaker for this item, and we do have her in the meeting. By all means, let's recognize her. Well, so good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for letting me comment as well. And I just wanted to thank the staff for working so hard with me to get all of the application materials in. Um, just to give a little very brief history, the Malibu Art Association was established back in the 60s. Um, I've only been with the Malibu Art Association now for a couple of years, and just in time, actually, to participate in nothing because of, <laughs> of the pandemic. And um, I, I do know that, you know, it has really Im impacted many of the artists uh, very deeply. Uh, not being able to, number one, share their art, but also not be able to um, uh, benefit financially uh, from the sales. Uh, the organization has been um, a supporter of um, scholarships for graduating Malibu High School seniors who are pursuing um, art as their, as their major, whether it's visual or performance art, and then also for um, providing books, we buy books for the library uh, for Malibu. We do not charge the artists uh, to participate in any of our exhibits um, because of our mission to try to support artists. And um, it's very difficult to have to try to pay to be in a show and, and then maybe you don't even sell. So we don't like to do that. We use our membership fees for that. Um, and then we've also used the membership fees to actually buy all of the display grids that the artists would be using so that we have a very nice display when we do do the exhibits. And so I'll, it's a very late evening and I'll stop talking now. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Barbara. Mikey, I see your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I would like uh, sort of do a little full disclosure here for a second. So Barbara and I um, met because of her attempt to do uh, an event, which is that date is now past. And um, it was a small event with some landscape artists at, at the park. And, um, you know, it turned into, it revealed something to me that um, I did not realize how hard it was to get a TUP for a small art event. And um, so I, um, I have talked to Trevor about our TUPs. I, I believe that all TUPs are not created equal and to have a small art event and have to go through what um, Barbara and her group was attempting to do, it did not seem to be very community serving. There's no amplified music. This is not, it's the same TUP if you're doing the chili cook-off or the triathlon as it is to get a few artists down in Legacy Park. 
Um, so I am exploring with, uh, and I, I promised this to Barbara, and she didn't ask me to, I wanted to, that I'm looking for ways that we can do these, you know, local serving small events without it being a, you know, you have to plan months in advance to get a few artists out to Legacy Park. So um, I think you can see where I'm heading. I feel really for what the artists and what Barbara and her group's been through, and I, and I will be. I did not know this was coming to us. I did not bring this forward. I had no idea, but I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. I have Karen and then Bruce. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I just, uh, first of all, I want to thank Jesse and uh, your whole department for this and for everything you do. And I know with uh, reopening, you've got a lot going on, but you, you did the whole time during the pandemic and the uh, closures. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, Barbara, you and I have not met. Um, I did have a discussion about this in general with um, Julia Holland, who is my uh, uh, appointment to the Arts Commission. And she, she was saying the same thing that Mikey was, that it was just daunting to uh, go through this application process. And I, I too would like to see us maybe have two categories or some threshold uh, quantifying factors. Uh, and Richard, I don't know if that's uh, something that you uh, can work on. I, I don't know how we set those wheels in motion, but but I think it's worth considering. Um, and uh, I'll let every anybody else talk who wants to, but I'm I'm definitely happy to see this on the agenda. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, I believe you're next. Hey, thanks. So uh, first of all, I'm I'm going to vote to approve a fee waiver. It seems like a pretty it seems like a no-brainer. Um, yeah, I was walking in the park a couple weeks ago with my wife and our dog, and my wife actually said, why don't we have events here, uh, like art shows? This was before this application came in, a, a crafts fair, a Halloween parade. And I told her, you know, I don't know that we're allowed to do those things like Legacy Park. I'm glad to hear that we are. So, you know, I hope we actually make better use of this community resource and that maybe this will be the start of something further. Um, this is the this is the third or fourth TUP fee waiver for a nonprofit, I think, in the short time that we've had this the new the, the newly convened council. Um, I, I like the suggestion by Mikey that, that's been supported by Karen of maybe having some kind of streamlined process for, for smaller events, but um, why not also have a policy for for um, allowing nonprofits or at least local nonprofits? to just have the fee waived so that we don't have to have these applications made to city council to do it when all we're going to do is say what a great organization it is. And of course, we're going to approve the waiver. Um, separate, but as part, and part, as part of such a policy, if we were to have one, I think we need a policy for determining when to do them and when not to do them um, so that it's, there's clear guidelines, some kind of standards, that may, maybe, maybe an income threshold for the organization, um, I, I don't know, just, it, it seems odd to just keep having these one-offs, especially since we most off, more often than not just grant them. Um, the other thing is, that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds, Steve, do you want like, to make a motion, I'd Steve? I'd like to make a motion to approve the fee waiver. I, 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 will, I will second it. And I want to also add the one thing that was missed here, this event had a TUP, but it was two years ago or whenever, when, when the COVID or no, I think Woolsey fired, I'm going to get it wrong. Barbara knows. Well, something took out the first one. Something took out, I mean, they've been in this process for so long. It's hysterical. I don't remember the details. It's not hysterical, funny. So, um, and I think when it comes to the TUPs, I, I picture a, a low to no impact events some sort of over-the-counter type of thing. Um, I don't know. I know there's a lot of details to work out, but that's how I picture it for a local artist event. Just, yeah, this is not the chili cook-off or the triathlon. Sounds like we have a motion and a second. Uh, we're open for discussion. I still see two hands raised. Bruce, I'm down to one hand raised. 
Yeah, just just one quick comment. I remember the other point I wanted to make, which is I, I, I'd like to get consensus from, you know, it would have been nice to see the speaker. And since we still are not anytime quickly going back to public uh, meetings, I'd like to get consensus to bring back an item, if I can, if we can, to consider whether to open the video to members of the public who are speaking, because I think we're really losing something in only seeing a black screen and hearing a voice. We all see each other. I think it adds to the ability to make make good decisions. So I, I, I hope that in connection with this, this is a good example, we can get that brought back as a formal matter. I, I think that probably you would have no problem with any of us if that were to end up on the agenda at the meeting in the first meeting in August. I would agree. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I agree. So thank you. Now that we've gone down that little detour, Kelsey, will you call the roll? Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And unless I miss my guess, the final uh, event of the evening is item 7A. Designation of a voting delegate and alternate voting delegate for the 2021 League of California Cities Annual Conference in Sacramento, which will be held on September 22nd to 24th. Do we have a staff report? Oh, I guess I just gave my report. Uh, are there any comments from the public? No, we do not have any speakers for this item. No one left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, council comments and discussions. Uh, I see Mikey's hand and I see Karen's hand so far. Mikey? I would like to nominate the mayor and mayor pro tem for the primary and secondary. I'll second and, that. You okay. beat me to it. And also announce that uh, sadly I will be missing the event. I will be out of the country. Heartbroken to be honest, but it's the way it goes. Okay, well, we're sorry that we will miss you. Uh, Paul, I was going to say the same thing. Oh, okay. Bruce? Well, it may, be, it may be obvious that that's already the vote, but I just want to say I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that, but if anyone else would like to, I'd support that as well. I think it should be the mayor and mayor pro tem. That makes sense to me. And I urge you to get a, get a reservation. I think I already have one. Good. We're set. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Can you call the roll, Kelsey? Just to clarify, 100%, that's the mayor as the designated voting delegate and the mayor pro tem as the alternate. That's correct. Yes. yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor pro tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn so you don't even have to vote on it. Adios, guys. Thanks for everyone being so prepared. Great, uh, great job, everyone. Thank you. And I want to thank the staff, as always, for being prepared and, uh, and trying to keep me on track, even when I forget to call for public comment. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye.